All right, so uh, we've already called this meeting to order. We just came out of an executive session, and our first order of business is to swear in Matthew Lawson. Come on down. All right, one of our new environmental commission members. All right, so Matthew, if you raise your right hand, I solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution. Actually, they were not the sorry. And will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio. Obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio. That I will, in all respects, that I will in all respects, observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter. And ordinance of the village of Yellow Springs. Ordinance of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of environmental commission. Of the office of environmental commission. All right. You're being sworn in. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, all right, so next up, uh, we have uh, announcements, and our first announcement, we're very excited to have uh, Ms. Wilson's fourth grade class, who is going to talk to us about housing affordability. So uh, I'd like to in introduce uh, Shannon Wilson and the, some of her class who's here. So, Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, unusual duties. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Wilson's fourth grade class for the whole year has engaged in a project called Human Centered Design in which they choose a problem, a human problem, and then all of the work that is that they do is around that problem. They actually uh, went downtown and interviewed people uh, downtown about what people thought were problems in Yellow Springs and what came up and what they chose was uh, housing issues, affordable housing issues. And so I have met with the class several times. They've been out to the glass farm. They made this great video. They've done a number of things, but I was so impressed with the video that they did that I wanted people to see it and then uh, just have a couple the students say a little bit about what they've been doing so we can start the video all right okay and everybody has to bear with me tonight because Judy's not here and I don't do this normally Thank <laughs> you. 
things that the class did was to actually develop a sustainable, energy efficient, small, what, 850? 850 square foot house that's right there. Um, is there anything else? We have a few minutes if any of the students would like to say. Do you, do you, do you guys just, we watched the video now, you see how much information you shared in the video. Is there anything else? that you want to say before we leave? Is there anything you feel like you want to make sure you say when you have this chance? Prepared to answer specific questions, oh, okay. but we don't want to take up too much of oh, your I forget time. what the question was. Well, one of the questions, is this supposed to be you? Well, this is what we did all day today. So I'm Marion McQueen, <laughs> and, I, and I want to ask you, why did you do this project? So, wait, is this thing on? Yeah. So when we were, um, okay, we were all really frustrated when we were sharing our circumstance on trying to get a house in Yellow Springs, because not many of us could get a house that, well, we decided to do something about it. Okay. Um, Can you guys say your names, please? What's your name, young man? Kiernan. Kiernan? Yes. I'm Rue Robertson, and we have decided to do this project to um, help the people around the community who would love to live in Yellow Springs and to help people who are open enrollment, which is about 50% of our classroom. Um, we know that it is a really, we know that it is hard, to, especially hard to find a house in Yellow Springs because the houses here are really expensive and mostly they often need significant renovation. And if you can find a house here in Yellow Springs, you, it'll probably sell before you can even make an offer because the demand here is so high and the supply is so low. And, and what's your name? Oh, my name is Lily, Anna. My name is Sailor, and um, so when we r realized that um, 
the glass farm property hasn't been used for decades, we decided that we would make a model of a tiny, um, eco-friendly, affordable house, and we um, thought it would be a great solution for the glass farm property. And the second question was, um, you recently made a survey. We had an exhibition night this spring, and the kids made a survey, and they surveyed the community once more about this specific issue, and what did you find? My name is Tavy, and the survey question was, how do you imagine Yellow Springs in 10 years if affordable housing isn't built? One of the things was that there will be less families living in Yellow Springs. And there, it will be less diverse. I'll do that too. <laughs> there will be less new people in Yellow Springs and there will be more older and wealthier people that live in Yellow Springs. Uh, the, the my name is Jonah and um, the village would also um, in 10 years be like um, like not as um, interesting as it um, is now. It wouldn't be like it is today. And um, it would be extremely hard to find a home here. And there'd be much less people in Yellow Springs. And it would, this would all lead to like a massive problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, I just want to say, guys, that was incredible. And I really appreciate the insights from your uh, project-based learning work. So what are our next steps? <laughs> and um, New Mexico, and she's going to do the real thing to build a tiny house. Well, how about what are our next steps to uh, address the affordable housing issue? What, well, uh, what are you going to help us do? Well, we were hoping that we were giving a, um, like an idea of what you guys could do on the, grass, on the glass farm property, so that way you could um, like make that house and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Spencer, if you want to zoom in on the house, maybe. Oh, move the model. Did it? That's pretty zooming right there, Chief. <laughs> I like those solar panels on yeah, the top. Yeah, me too. That's really cool. And the trees. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's in your tree there. <laughs> oh, I see. And the floor plan is marked yes. on the floor so yes. you can see the layout. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's what, a three bedroom? Uh, two bed. Two Three bedroom, two bathroom house, passive solar to fit a family of five. And the kids designed and built it themselves. Wow. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds to me like this is a discussion that uh, we would like to continue. And we also want you guys to be involved in the work that our housing committee is doing. And uh, 
this is really important, uh, and I think you guys really captured the essence of why this has become a priority for council. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Ms. Wilson. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. You. Bye, guys. <laughs> hey, thanks, Chris. Thanks for um, coming. As, uh, as we've got some folks exiting, uh, we probably do have a few other announcements. I do want to announce something very exciting, which is that we are now live streaming. And this is something we've talked about for a long time. But if you go to the Village of Yellow Springs Facebook page, uh, Spencer has put a link up. And so from here on out, uh, if you do not have cable, you can access through YouTube our meetings and you can watch them live. So pretty incredible. Thank you, Spencer, for making that happen. I'm really happy. Uh, do we have any other announcements? Yes, we do. The Gaunt Pool Passes are now on sale, and people can get them at the Youth Center in the bottom floor near the Bryan Center gym. Um, Monday through Friday from noon to 7 p.m. And then later they will be sold at the pool. OK. Um, and the, I, can I add? And that includes swimming for all passes. Oh, and the swimming for all passes. The Antioch Village uh, presentation will be on May 24th, uh, this Thursday at 7 o'clock at the Coretta Scott King Center for those who are interested in that project. Um, I have uh, some non-human announcements. We were successful in uh, giving the Bobcats of Ohio a reprieve from being uh, killed, hunted, and trapped. Uh, the village passed a resolution in that regard. Also, at the glass farm have been, well, there's, the, I guess, the first sighting in a long time of a, a rare bird called the king rail. And this is, the birders are just wild about this, I guess. And if you go on Facebook, you can see pictures of this. Scott Solzenberg has a bunch of pictures. And the red-necked phalanthrope is also at the glass farm, mm -hmm. among other birds, too. So it's become quite a birding site. Wow. So those are my announcements. Okay. I wanted to just add to the, uh, I, th I think uh, we need to get more information about the Swimming for All program, for, which is for people of modest to low income, um, that, they ha that we um, have a special program to reduce the rates for families and individuals. Uh, we want everybody to be able to use our swimming pool, and we don't want income to be a barrier at all. And uh, so uh, people come up to see Ruth. Ruth Ann, is it? We're doing, or this, we're doing them through the, um, through the youth center and the pool now. They don't okay. have to come to see Ruth. Oh, they don't. Okay, no. excellent. Yeah, and I, and I wondered if maybe the newspaper could highlight it as well, because um, I've talked to some people who were not aware of it, and I, somehow we need to get the word out more effectively, I think. Thank right. you. Uh, Lisa? I have an answer. Oh, and, uh, before the uh, class left, they dropped off a petition that they've all signed that says, I think it would be a good idea to build small energy efficient affordable homes on the glass farm property. And so I'll pass that on to uh, Marianne. Um, I, I wanted to mention that June 2nd is National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of way to signal your support of National Gun Violence Awareness is to wear orange. There's a website uh, called wearorange.org that tells you more about this organization and the work that it does. The organization was formed by a group of friends of a young woman who, from Chicago who marched and performed uh, in uh, uh, Barack Obama's second inauguration and talked about gun violence and then went home to Chicago and was shot in an incident of violence. So I know that gun violence is something that we're all very concerned about right now. So I just wanted to mention June 2nd, National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Thanks. Lisa, thanks for sharing that. And um, related to that, uh, there I've been doing some research. I think there are two things we can do as a village related to this. One is uh, the Vote 16 initiative, which uh, the District of Columbia has actually been pursuing, and I learned that Ohio being a home rule state is open to this as well. And the second thing is Cincinnati a while back success successfully passed a uh, ban on semi-automatic weapons that passed the Ohio Supreme Court. 
So these are two things that I think we should explore and I'll be bringing to our next meeting. Um, additionally, some real quick things. Uh, this Wednesday, May 23rd, is another community opportunity to participate in the active transportation plan at the Yellow Springs Brewery. That's from 7 to 9 p.m. And uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback already, but on June 27th, our consultant, we remember we got a grant to do this from the state, uh, will be presenting their thoughts about priority projects. So make sure to weigh in on what you think is important to make our community safer, more walkable, more bikeable. Um, also, uh, uh, Florence Randolph and Chief Carlson will be uh, talking to the James A. McKee Group at Antioch University Mid Midwest also this Wednesday at 11.30. That's in room B105 about our uh, police outreach, community outreach. And I do want to highlight that the Restorative Justice Symposium, uh, second annual, will be happening on June 1st and 2nd. And I believe that's all happening at the Bryan Center. Is that correct? I, or is it's it kind of the same as last year where the-, the Bryan Center and Antioch College. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's plenty of information about that on the web. Okay, so any other announcements? So we have the consent agenda. Uh, we have uh, the minutes from our May 7th meeting and uh, three pieces of legislation that were related to updating our zoning uh, ordinances. Uh, so I would entertain a motion uh, to adopt the consent agenda. I'll move that we adopt the consent agenda. I second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, now it's time to uh, review the agenda. Any uh, changes or proposed additions to tonight's agenda? I, I wanted to ask if the discussion uh, about uh, the, the Justice System Task Force recommendation, we have 20 minutes. Uh, I think the discussion is going to be a little more complex because of uh, the different points of view on it, and I wondered if we could have a little bit longer time. I was going to suggest 30 minutes. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, let's. Uh. And then um, in under new business, um, Patty and I were going to bring from the Energy Board um, an idea around an RFP uh, to help uh, do educate for uh, a proposal for education to help people reduce their utility bills and their use of of uh, energy. So, okay. okay. Um, anything else? Uh, I did want to add, and I think this goes under old business, just real briefly to clarify, um, I watched the meeting from last time and I was out of town for work about uh, what we have done with commission budgets. And so I just want to clarify that quickly um, under old business. Thank okay. Um, I, I'd like to um, have a few minutes since we have the whole council it's in some place in the agenda to talk about public re record requests. Okay. And I um, don't know if that would be under new business or old business. Um, I think, well, I, I mean, it was in Judy's report last time, so maybe that's new business as opposed to old business because we haven't really had it. Um, okay. So, uh, Marianne, could you uh, tell us about the petitions and communications? Yep. So, we had two letters from the chamber, one from uh, Alex Scott, who's here, and Karen Winthrop, who's also here, um, about the benefits of uh, street fair in particular and uh, festivals to the village of Yellow Springs and, and to communities in general. Uh, a letter from uh, Jackie Ashworth at the college thanking the crew for their timely and efficient service in fixing a water main break at the college. Uh, we had the treasurer's report from Rachel McKinley showing increased uh, return from our investment. <coughs> a letter from Lisa Walters uh, in support of uh, free uh, event service, the village providing free services for events in the village. We had um, uh, a notice of a workshop uh, sponsored by NAMI and some other organizations on uh, suicide prevention on June 18th at 7 p.m. 
there was information on, and I, do you say Hobie? I don't know. Yeah. Hobie? Hobie. 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 Yeah. Um, the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Seminars, and we actually have a resolution in that regard. It was coming up. And then lastly, there was some uh, supporting information for Tobacco 21 from the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, and some other organizations. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, we're now going to move on to our legislation. And uh, the first up is Ordinance 2018-15. And our Deputy Clerk, Patty Bates, could you read that in by title only? I certainly can as soon as I can get to it in my packet. Problem. Got it here, Pat. You have it. Hey. Approving the editing and inclusion of certain ordinances and resolutions. Uh, AS Arts, as I believe she means as parts of the various component codes of the codified ordinances, approving, adopting, and enacting new matter in the updated and revised codified ordinances repealing ordinances and resolutions in conflict therewith, publishing the enactment of new matter and declaring an emergency. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I so, move. I second. Okay, Chris, do you want to explain the purpose of this ordinance? Uh, sure, I mean, essentially uh, over the course of the years, most villagers are aware that there are a number of changes that happen, mo modifications, amendments to ordinances, and those are all reflected in the big brown book that's published by American Publishing, uh, Legal Publishing, and these reflect those changes that are done, um, and we get the book updated. Okay, great. It's a housekeeping measure. Yes. All right, so um, since this is emergency legislation, I'm going to open the public hearing. So first of all, any questions or comments from council? Any questions or comments from citizens? Okay, if not, uh, Patty, could you call the roll? Uh, yes, McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Hempling? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Kausch? Yes. Okay, next we have Ordinance 2018-16. Uh, this is the second reading, and Patty again by title only. Repealing Section 1020.04a, Maintenance Requirements of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1020.04a, Maintenance Requirements. Okay, great. Um, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Denise, I guess you'll just stay up and talk about yeah. each one of these briefly. Yeah. <laughs> these okay. are also housekeeping uh, in the zoning code. Um, the nine-inch requirement for grass um, was changed in the Chapter 67402 of the Weeds Ordinance last year, and this was recently discovered in the right-of-way section, so we're just keeping the language consistent. Okay. Uh, again, since this is the second reading, I'll open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from Council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, Patty, could you call the roll? Krieger? Yes. Hempling? Yes. Stokes? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. All right, 2018-17 by title only, please. Repealing section 1248.01A, RA Low Density Residential District of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new section 1248.01A, RA Low Density Residential District. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right, Denise? Well, um, only in residential A does it use the word approximately. Um, so we just wanted to strike it from there. It's okay. not in RB or RC. It has a definite right. number it of units. It is six units. units. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, second reading, open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, Patty, please call the roll. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Housh? Yes. Hempling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. <clears throat> All right. Ordinance 2018-18, again by title only, please. Repealing section 1260.04A6, uses accessory buildings and structures of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new section 1260.04A6, uses accessory buildings and structures. All right. I'd like to have a motion. So moved. Second. All right. Denise. Again, um, floor area gross is in the uh, definitions which is the sum of the horizontal um, area of several floors of a building. It was not also in 
this section of the code, so one might uh, determine it to just be uh, the building footprint, so we wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, as you can tell, this is all housekeeping to keep our zoning uh, up to date. Um, again, it's a second reading, so I will open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right, if not, Patty, please call the roll. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempling. Yes. Freer. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. Ordinance 2018-19, uh, again by title only. Repealing Section 1262.02B, Procedures, Public Notice of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and then replacing it with a new Section 1262.02B, Procedures, Public Notice. All right. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Denise. Uh, um, not in my recent memory. Um, has the, uh, it been the clerk council's duty to um, take care of the public notices and getting the letters out and putting up signs. So I wanted that to reflect the actual person who does that, which is planning and zoning administrator. Oh, great. Uh, again, this is the second reading. So I'm going to open the public hearing. Questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, Patty, the roll call. Hempley? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Pausch? Yes. McQueen? Yes. All right. Ordinance 2018-20 uh, by title only. Repealing Section 1250.03A, Spatial Requirements, Dimensional Requirements, Business Districts of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new Section 1250.03A, Spatial Requirements, Dimensional Requirements, Business Districts. All right. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Denise? Uh, foot, <coughs> footnote six, there was an error. Um, it should be rear yard and not side yard abutting a residential district or a village boundary line. So that was changed. Okay, great. Uh, again, this is second reading, so I'm gonna open the public hearing. Questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right, uh, Patty, could you call the roll? McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Housh? Yes. Templin. Yes. All right. Ordinance 2018-21 by title only. Repealing section 1262.08E1, conditional use requirements, residential accessory dwelling units of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new section 1262.08E1, conditional use requirements, residential accessory dwelling units. All right. I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. Denise? Uh, latest uh, conditional use hearing, we had a property owner who did not want to be required to have a microwave, and, we, and the Planning Commission all agreed, so we added oven and or microwave. Okay, and I would just like to um, uh, 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 suggest an amendment, which is to put the comma after the stove uh, <laughs> instead of after and or, so that it's clear. So I think it's just a... Right, in the parenthetical, there's a list of those items. Um, so this is the second reading, and uh, I will open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right, so uh, I would like to make a motion then to approve this ordinance as amended by moving the comma. Second. All right, uh, roll call, please. Housh. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes? Yes. Templin? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Thank you, Denise. Okay. Do we have to vote on it again? If, so no. We voted only on the amendment. Okay. The, the okay. amendment was included to pass. Okay. Great. Okay. So now uh, we'll slow things down a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about Resolution 2018-14. Um, Patty, I think you can read that in. Uh, actually, let's read that in full. Okay. Creating an economic development incentive policy. Whereas the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs firmly believes that economic development is essential to the continued financial health and well being of the village, and whereas incentives related to economic development are extremely helpful in not only attracting new businesses but also in assisting existing businesses to expand and develop, and whereas incentives have been offered by the village in the past in order to attract and assist business development, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs wishes to revive that practice under new guidelines that are in concurrence with the stated village values. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, that Section 1, the Economic Development Incentive <coughs> Policy attached as Exhibit A is hereby adopted. 
Section 2, the village manager is instructed to implement the economic development incentive policy. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Lisa, you want to talk about this one, please? Yes, this is something that the um, Economic Sustainability Commission has been working on for quite some time. I'd like to thank them for their work on this. Um, we've, as the, as the um, document stated, this is something that we've been doing as a village for a long time, giving incentives, but we thought that it was important to move towards um, more objectivity and mm, define a policy and a process and a scoring sheet so that when incentives are requested for various reasons, we have both consistency and a documentation for how um, we're granting those incentives. So this is kind of the culmination of a, quite a bit of work, um, and that's what the incentive policy is about. Great, and uh, I also really appreciate the work <laughs> Because as Lisa pointed out, we want to um, be less arbitrary about these decisions. And to that extent, um, I have a recommendation for uh, amending the resolution. So I'm just going to read this out and um, uh, I'll, I'll read it slowly. Um, I think we need to recognize this piece about um, being consistent and not arbitrary. So I wrote, whereas incentives need to be given to businesses and organizations intentionally with clear benefits to citizens and in a consistent and unarbitrary matter. Hmm. Does that work? Um, so because I, I know that's the intent of this uh, policy, but I want to make sure that we uh, capture that in our resolution. Um, and then the only other thing that uh, I, I mentioned two meetings ago is that we need to update with the new village values um, because we remember we did add our anti-racism value. Um, so I think those two th changes need to be made. All right. Any? Yeah, I, I'd like to suggest, Lisa, would you read what the possible incentives are because it's not necessarily clear. Um, incentive requests that support village values include but are not limited to the following, low interest loans or grants, abatement, credit of income or property tax, land sale or swap, utility easements or extensions, other infrastructure, fee waivers, and others as deemed appropriate. Okay. Um, any, Judith? Um, we had, I, I don't remember where this got left. Um, I think I had brought up uh, when we were talking about this, this, you know, we're still looking at, and Kevin and I need to bring something, I probably to the next council meeting, about this idea of diversity hiring practices that we hope to adopt mm -hmm. as, a, as a village. And do we want to specifically say something about that? Uh, so I, I, th I think I thought that is what we had talked about, but. Um, so um, that's not explicitly included in the scoring sheet mm -hmm. or stated in the incentive policy at this point. Well, uh, although since uh, part of the scoring sheet is our village values. True. That is, mm -hmm. and you get, you are scored by our village values, which mm -hmm. do highlight that, you know, what's the basis of that diversity outreach policy. It doesn't explicitly state. Right. I mean, that I guess one element, yeah. I guess is what I'm saying. I guess what I'm thinking is if we want, you know, I had thought if the village uh, uh, adopts diversity hiring practices, we actually have, you know, a piece of paper that explains what that means. Uh, and it had this, uh, that not that's, that another, uh, you know, business or nonprofit might uh, have a different way of doing it. But I do wonder if we would, I think it would make sense for us to, because my thought was that if we did that, that we would want to encourage other in, in, uh, organizations, businesses, nonprofits to do the same. And um, again, they don't have to do it just the way we do it, but to just really look at their hiring practices. And there are, you know, that's not something we're making up. Diversity hiring practices is a thing out there that businesses think about and adopt, so. Well, what we could do is add um, on that scoring sheet yeah, a question about do you have this policy? Um, yeah. So yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I would like to see that added. Okay. So is that a, do I make that as an amendment? Yeah, so I think we'll 
maybe at the end we'll compile okay. the amendments. Okay. Um, any other comments from council? Any questions or comments from citizens? <laughs> oh, Karen, sorry. I didn't look far enough. And I've got a bad left eye, so you got to. <laughs> Hi, Karen Wintrow, uh, Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce. Um, I like the fact that it was written around supporting business, but, but actually I think the Economic Sustainability Commission and the practice of council has been to extend these incentives to organizations, nonprofit organizations, so I wonder if there should be some um, modification of the language to say business and nonprofit. Um, okay. Because it, the, the resolution itself did seem very focused on. Well, that in my whereas, I was intentional about saying organizations and businesses, but do you see another place to add that <coughs> as well? Whereas you just added? Yes. The whereas you just added? Okay, yeah. excuse me. So, yeah, it was okay. a bunch of words, though. Um, <laughs> you lost me, Brian. Sorry. I tried to speak slowly. Um, Okay, but I, I very much agree with that. We have many of our nonprofits in town that um, have uh, shown the economic benefits of incentives, uh, one of those being Home Inc. And that's stated clearly in the incentive policy by for profit and nonprofit entities. Yes. Great. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I, this is a question. So, one of the other things that we're considering is fees for event services. So. Is there a way that the incentives that are listed here, would they include that? I mean, it's really services. It's the village providing services with no charge. Is that outside of this? Um, so I can weigh in just, you know, from my tenure in council. Um, the Economic Sustainability Commission started, began working on this incentive policy. Um, it was actually in final draft well before this uh, more recent issue about paying for events came up. Um, I don't recall that when we talked about the um, qualifying cr criteria um, that economic sustainability included services, fee, fee for event services as part of the list. Um, I guess I feel like I don't want to take any action that delays approval of this incentive policy given the amount of time and work that's gone into it. Um, but I can see your point that there could be an overlap if council agrees that there will be a fee for services. If we say there will not be a fee for services, yeah. then it should yeah. not be part of the incentive policy. So then a fee, if we did charge fees, then a fee waiver could be. Would be then it could, but I, I think we, we haven't had that other discussion okay. yet. Right. I, the other thing I remember us talking about is at least treating them in a, in a consistent manner. So even if we don't, uh, you know, put the two together, that we would have a similar kind of process if we, you know, do make that decision. Um, Rachel, did you have? Okay, great. Any other comments? Okay, if not, um, I would like to entertain a motion to uh, uh, for the resolution to pass with the three amendments, which I had as adding diversity hiring practices to our um, uh, criteria list updating the village values and adding the whereas about um, being intentional and consistent with nonprofit organizations and businesses. Would, would you read that whereas again? I will. And then I will. Whereas incentives need to be given to businesses and organizations um, intentionally with clear benefits to citizens and in a consistent and unarbitrary manner. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. All right. So 2018-19 is our last piece of legislation. And Patty, if you don't mind reading in that by uh, in full. Uh, we should Did be I? at 2018 Oh, sorry. Thank you. You're right. 2018-18, right? 17. 17. 
Did I go that far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. Wow, you can tell her that I want to move on. So. Um, okay, so resolution 2018-17 uh, uh, by title only, please. Awarding a contract to High Tech Electrical Contractors LLC for the removal and replacement of 11 electrical poles and lines for the Village of Yellow Springs. I'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. All right, Patty. Uh, actually, Johnny. Oh, Johnny's here. Thank you, Johnny. Come on up. These are 11 poles that we as staff do not have time or the safety measures to be able to change them out safely. Uh, this is also the same contractor that did 10 uh, and 15 or 16. Uh, so we got another bid from them, and that's the price. Okay. Did you want we, are, we are furnishing all the material that is labor only. And, and about going out for more, yeah. I can get a better price if I was to do more than 10 or 11 poles at a time. But I got to have the authorization to go out for more poles. If I went out for 90 poles, it could be significantly less, but the price could be extremely higher. The, the reason we have problems getting bids is because nobody wants to bid on a job this small, believe Correct. it or not. This is a mm -hmm. small job for an electrical contractor. And we have a total of 90 poles that we need them to someone to eventually do. Other we, than have, we have 180, but we feel we can do 90 right. of them, we can do half of them uh, by staff. So we just want you to be aware, especially when we talk about the upcoming infrastructure discussion, Correct. that this is something we could get done more quickly and probably save on per poll. But at this point, we need to move forward <coughs> with what we can get to. If we drop this down to fewer polls, even high tech wouldn't want to do it. So why have we not gone for the 90 polls? What, why, why just go out for 11? Uh, that's just trying to do it in short increments it's, so we don't deplete the funds. Yeah. Would it, I mean, I know we're not going to go back this year, I don't, I assume, but would it deplete the fund so much? So uh, just for, in case people didn't see it, so it's $49,000 just for the putting in of the pole, of 11 poles. It's not even the pole. That's it's not, not the material. That's not the material. The uh -huh. So well, we have probably th about seventy thousand dollars by the time we're done replacing. Well, we have three hundred and fifty thousand in our capital budget, right? So yeah. Okay. I believe so. So so leading from that, I'm assuming that you, the two of you, I guess, made the choice in prioritizing things that we have the, other things. These are eleven crucial poles that need to be changed out within two months. We actually have one that is uh, a hazard right now and we cannot address that poll until we have others that are gonna be a problem. But what I, what I meant was to the question of why we're not doing more <coughs> polls. Correct. I would assume that given the amount of money that we have and the other things that we need to do, there are other priorities for this year. Is that right? Or other than the, we could spend a 90 poles out over a couple of years, I believe, but we're, we're flirting with the fine line because they've already been rejected as, as poll No, replacement. why not just do the 90 poles this year? That's yeah, have we given an indication I, I we don't budget, want? I did not budget, but we could take it out of the capital funds. I only budget $100,000 a year uh, for poll replacements. I mean, would we be able to, if we did the 90 polls this year, would we be able to do the other things that we need to do over the next couple of years? I believe okay. so. But, so but we just need to think about it differently to the future. Correct. Yeah. Well, uh, I, or maybe think about it differently now. I mean, that, and, and again, perhaps this is, we're doing this in a vacuum absent that broader conversation mm -hmm. about capital costs. <clears throat> if we have the budget and we know it needs to be done um, would, would broadening the contract to get done what needs to get done slow down the process a lot? Well, I, my recommendation would be that we go ahead with the polls, with these 11 polls, and let them get started on it. And by the time they are getting these done, we're going to be having our broader conversation. So when you say, though, it's gonna co it would cost more, I mean, I mean, sorry, that it would cost less to have a bigger well, contract, how much less? I can't give you that, but I can tell you that they, they're all mobilized to come into town for 11 poles. They normally work another utility, so if they're coming into town to change 90 poles, they're, they're planning on being here for 
four or five months changing these poles out because the majority of them end up right away. So you mentioned uh, for these 11 that are, cr well, one or a few that are crucial is safety. You, you mentioned yes. the safety equipment in terms, in, in addition to having the bandwidth from a labor perspective. Correct. I mean, what's the, what's the big driver for these 11? Is it safety uh, and the fact that these are One of them crucial? has a arm on it that is actually, when it rains, it actually is burning in half. And we cannot address that pole until we take care of one that's directly holding that pole up. And it's right against the building. I, it's actually built the gutter around the pole. The, the, uh, the cost for these 11 poles is about 44, a little over $4,400 a pole. If we did all 90 poles, we would probably drop that down to about probably 4000 a pole. <coughs> something I, like that. I, that would be a, probably a pretty good guess. But yeah. It could drop. Yeah. The other thing is, is it's going to be a larger contract and we're going to have to go out for an RFP. Right. And then right. you'll get multiple people bidding on it, you know. So therefore, you, they're going to be trying to cut their numbers down. So, so that's the delay would be the RFP. Yeah. It's probably too late for this summer. Okay. Uh, we, could, we could put it out this summer and it's stuff that can be done in the wintertime. Oh. And it actually would be better on the yards if we actually did it in the wintertime when it was froze or when the grass was not growing at the same time, the weeds and mosquitoes and all that. Mm -hmm. So okay. I think we would do the first 11, put an RFP out to change another 80 poles and see what we get. Okay. Well, I, I think you're hearing that that is, okay. Uh, okay. resonates with council. So thank, thank you, Johnny. You. Any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Uh, okay, uh, now we go to 2018-18. Uh, Patty, go ahead and read that in full, please. Appointing Johnny Burns as Public Works Director. Whereas the position of Public Works Director currently exists in the Village Organizational Chart as approved by Council, but said position has been unfilled for several years, and whereas the village as a whole is experiencing an unprecedented need for the close coordination of all infrastructure projects to make the best use of limited resources, and whereas filling the position of public works director with a highly qualified individual would better facilitate the coordination of all capital improvements, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs internally posted the notice for the vacant position of public works director and formed an interview committee that identified and interviewed two candidates, and whereas the interview committee met with prospective candidates and provided feedback to the village manager to consider for the purpose of making the final hiring decision as prescribed under the village charter, and whereas the village manager has considered the feedback and determined that Johnny Burns should be extended an offer of employment as public works director for the village of Yellow Springs and make same recommendation to council. Now therefore, council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that. Johnny Burns is hereby extended an offer of employment to serve as public works director for the village of Yellow Springs to serve at the pleasure of the village manager. The section two, the duties of the public works director shall be the, those as provided for in the job description for the public works director and pursuant to the employment agreement attached to this resolution as exhibit A. Section three, the employment agreement is hereby approved in substantially the same form as exhibit A. The village manager is hereby authorized to execute the employment agreement and to take other such actions on behalf of the village as may be necessary to assure this appointment. Section 5, this resolution shall be in full force and effect upon its adoption. It is the intent of the council that the employment agreement be effective upon signature by the parties. Okay. Uh, I'd like to get a motion. So move. Second. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, sorry, who was that? Judith and? Marianne. Kevin. Oh, was that Kevin? <laughs> That's arm wrestle over. Oh, see? <laughs> I, Mary Ann was closer to me. Um, all right, Patty, do you want to say anything? Yes. Um, first of all, I want everyone to understand that Johnny's been acting in this capacity since Jason resigned his position with the village uh, last fall. Second, I want you to understand that he has done an exemplary job. Um, you are going to be amazed at the difference in the, po in the way the pool looks when you get a chance to look at that. You're going to be amazed at the difference in the Bryan Center. And I have heard nothing but compliments from the public about Johnny's service. Alex is sitting there nodding her head. Um, I think the mayor's happy with the whole office renovation. And so um, all around, Johnny is the person for this. He comes to us with not only the 25, the four years that he's been here with the village, but he has 25 years of private sector experience. He's been a supervisor for 18 of those years. 
Um, it, it's uh, his knowledge and his expertise and his, his ability to figure out the best way to do something for the village, uh, and that includes at you know, the minimal cost is, is incredible and he astounds me every day with it. I cannot say enough. So um, that's my recommendation to council and I would like your approval of this contract. And I just want to add to that. Um, I've been really impressed, Johnny, by the attitude that you brought to the job and the pride that you have in the village. And I hear that over and over in your message about the new way that we're going to approach things. I really appreciate that. We are thinking about planning for the future in a much different way. And I know you heard Lisa talk a lot at the last meeting about becoming the infrastructure queen or guru, right? <laughs> right. Is that what she said? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we, goddess. 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 I like that. <laughs> yeah. So we are all paying attention to this and we are thinking about, you know, we've implemented dig once policies. Johnny understands the value of shared services when we can do that. Um, we're really changing the way that we approach things because that's one of the ways that we can uh, continue to reduce costs. So with that, uh, any other questions or comments from council? Uh, questions or comments from villagers? Okay. If not, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. And finally, 2018-19. Uh, Patty, if you don't mind reading that in full so people understand what it's about. Honoring Southwest Ohio Hugh O'Brien Youth Hobby for outstanding accomplishments and declaring June 28th to July 1st, 2018 as Southwest Ohio Hugh, Hugh O'Brien Youth Days in the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio supports the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership or Hobby Program goal to inspire and develop our global community of youth and volunteers to a life dedicated to leadership, service, and innovation. And whereas the summer of 1950, in the summer of 1958, actor Hugh O'Brien, motivated by the unforgettable experience he had with Dr. Albert Schweitzer, developed a leadership seminar focused on young leaders of our nation. And whereas the core values that guide the vision of the hobby team center around volunteerism, integrity, excellence, diversity, and community partnership. And whereas in the 60 years that hobby has been in existence, it consistently receives honors as one of our nation's top youth leadership organizations with participants in all 50 states and more than 20 countries, over 4,000 volunteers who have logged over 3.5 million hours of service, making over an $85 million economic impact on communities, and whereas Hobby carries out its mission by inspiring young people to make a difference and become catalysts for positive change in their home, school, workplace, and community, and whereas the Southwest Ohio Hobby Leadership Seminar will take place June 28th to July 1st, 2018 at Antioch College, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of Village, for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby, Section 1, congratulate Southwest Ohio Hobby for its positive effect on youth and community. <coughs> Section 2, proclaim June 28th through July 1st, 2018 as Southwest Ohio Hugh O'Brien Youth Days in the Village of Yellow Springs. Section 3, encourage all citizens to acknowledge the importance of successfully motivating our youth and encouraging them to be an inspiration to others. And we certainly saw that this earlier in the meeting. So uh, I'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. OK. Uh, I'm not sure we need any discussion. Uh, everything's highlighted in the resolution. It's exciting that Antioch College is hosting this event. Um, so I will, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 OK. Now is the time in the agenda for citizen concerns. And again, I just want to emphasize these are topics that are not on the agenda. So if you're here to talk about Tobacco 21 or Events for Services or some of those other topics, uh, Mayor's Court, um, those will be coming up next. So are there any citizen concerns? OK, if not, we will move to old business. And first on the agenda is Tobacco 21. Um, I just want to say a few things about this discussion. Uh, at uh, two meetings ago, we had a very extensive discussion about the benefits and pros of this kind of uh, policy. So our focus today, um, and we've dedicated, probably we're looking at about 15 minutes, is on hearing um, some of the, the cons or uh, uh, reasons why we might want not want to pass this legislation in Yellow Springs. Uh, so with that, um, do council members have anything they would like to say before we hear from citizens? Okay. 
If not, would anyone like to speak to the Tobacco 21 proposed policy? Okay, Don Beard. How do you do, guys? So, my name is Don Beard with the uh, Trail Tavern, Peaches Grill, and the Import House. Um, Import House has been in town 32 years. Uh, as part of our business plan, what we try to do is to, to cultivate the first time shopper to our town, which is usually the 16 year old, first time in a car, travels to Yellow Springs, uh, starts their shopping experience with us. Um, our feeling is with this is we cultivate that group to then stay with us, and as they turn 18 years old, then they are able to purchase tobacco supplies at our place. If at the age of 21 is when we're going to start that, we believe that we're going to lose that group. They're going to go elsewhere for these supplies. Um, as you well know, I mean, our town is how many what square miles, one, two, whatever. This is only going to affect the, the village of Yellow Springs. You can go five minutes one way, eight minutes one way, 10 minutes another, and acquire whatever tobacco supplies you want. Uh, we've done an informal survey uh, over about the last two or three weeks at the import house, and literally 43% of our sales are done to 16 to 20 year old people. Um, if, if you ever come downtown on any given weekend and you observe the groups of 16 to 20 year old people that are in shopping and going to stores and buying in restaurants, and we certainly see enough of them at Peaches in the Trail Tavern, this is a big group to alienate. And, and I think legislation like this has, it, that is the only thing that this is going to do. I don't see how the benefits of you know, a town this size, limiting tobacco use is, and my understanding is this is not, it's only going to be enforced to the retailer, not to the purchaser. So, I mean, that's even less of an enforcement. Uh, I, I heard Shanaz last week address that their figures say that anybody, any place that's done this is they're looking at like a 2% difference in their gross sales. For us, I, I don't even see how that could remotely be. Uh, it, that purchasing group is just too big in, in our store to it not make a bigger impact. And honestly, I, I don't see how it wouldn't for any of the tobacco retailers. Tom Gray is in here this evening. Tom owns, of course, Tom's Market. We're lucky to have a market of the quality of Tom's in town. With the way electric has went, with water has went, with property taxes has went, this is taking yet another revenue stream away from him. I mean, this is a man that's already in a pitch battle with the Kroger stores. So, I mean, I think maybe, you know, someone might think this is insignificant, but again, it is another revenue stream. For the nippers, this is going to be roughly the same kind of a situation. Any convenience store is a one-stop shop. Um, if I want to stop there, I want to get my cigarettes, I want to get my beer, I want to get my snack, I'm back on the road, I go. If I can't get those three, then more than likely I'm going to head five minutes out of town. I'll hit the next place it does, and again, we've lost revenue in town. The only thing that this seems as though this is going to hurt is the local retailer. I, I just don't see the health benefit of what this does. And it's kind of a sidebar. I don't know many people that start smoking at the age of 18. Any other friend I've ever had started at 14, 15, younger. So that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Don. Um, and, uh, and actually, you were right on three minutes. I, I did, failed to mention that uh, we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. And uh, Patty, are you keeping mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. OK. Any other comments from citizens? Dennis Nipper. Dennis Nipper, been a long time resident for 67 years, 45 of those working for the village of Yale Springs. And one real quick comment, I'm offended that somebody would come up here and make a comment about my financial stuff, about the 2%, stuff like that. It's none of their business, what we do or what Don does. Or okay. That's a little comment. The question to the council is that, has the council instructed the village solicitor in any way to look at a uh, draw up what an ordinance would look like? Uh, is that the only question you have? No, or? no, I got no. Okay. I'm waiting for yes we'll, no. we'll, we'll kind of. I mean, we usually collect the questions, but at this point, oh, we're still okay. take we're still taking information. Okay. So, and I guess the next question is that other than the retailer be be uh, fine for selling. What do we do, an 18, 19-year-old Antioch student walking down the town smoking? 
do you want your police department to pull up, get out of the car, and ask for their ID? Is that our culture that we want to object to everybody in the country that uh, the police? Chief Carlson will not want to come to work on Monday. I can guarantee you he will not want to come because the police officers will walk downtown, stop anybody that looks like they're under 21, you have your ID, because you got a cigarette in your hand. Can they come into our store and buy a pack of cigarettes, walk right out the store, light it up, stand on the sidewalk, and wave at the police, go by smoking? And that's totally legal, but they can't come in and buy. The 21-year-old can buy a pack and give it to the 18. Is that, you know, you want us to harass the people? I don't want to be harassed. I don't want my kids to be, you know, if they're doing something wrong, that's, you know, if it's statewide, then I have no problem with it being statewide, everybody's doing it. But do you want your police department, and I feel bad for Chief Carlson, he's going to have to deal with this every Monday, and Mr. Councilman Stokes works at Antioch College, and at Antioch College, there'll be a 21-year-old, hey, I'm making a run to young, uh, two miles up the road, who wants a pack of cigarettes? Give him the money, her the money, they'll come back, sit over at the college, come downtown and smoke, same way. These kids will still get their smokes no matter what. And it's not fair to penalize this one. They're going to be walking up and down the street smoking. Is that what you want your police department to do? Okay, now, Chief Carlson may look at it differently, but uh, I can tell you, you're opening a whole can of worms that we don't want the community to look at. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dennis. And, and again, I do want to clarify, um, at this point, this is discussion, uh, but I, I think we will be deciding what our next steps are uh, after what we hear tonight. Um, uh, Brian, yes. I wonder if we should hear from the chief. He, he wrote a report, but I'm sure many people didn't, uh, didn't read it, uh, you know, people out here. So I wondered if you wanted uh, to just... Report on no, no, yeah. no. I, I wrote, I wrote the report on this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, any other? I thought citizens might want to hear it and comment on it. That was the reason I thought it would oh, okay. be worth uh, raising that ahead of time. Okay. Jessica? Uh, my name is Jessica Thomas. Um, I am vehemently opposed to this. I, other than the fact that we are just stomping on a person's rights that they should have, I, I think that as a community who claims to be progressive, we shouldn't be going backwards with age limits. And furthermore, I think that we should be working harder to decriminalize more drugs, marijuana, for example, in order to really educate people on how to use these things in a safe way instead of spending money on enforcing a law like this, we could use it on, to educate young people on the drawbacks of using tobacco. It doesn't make sense to spend more money enforcing a law that is not going to be applied very well and is only going to affect a certain age group. And like Mr. Nipper said, um, it's not something that we're going to stop young people from accessing. Okay. I, wa I want to ask again that the staff report be read because I think uh, there's maybe some misunderstandings, but I, I feel like there's a piece of information. Probably a lot of people here have not read it. Um, That's right. my feeling before so we hear further. Chief comment. Carlson, I think uh, Judith would like you to. I guess it's from yet. Chief uh, Chris Connard and Patty, so maybe Patty's the one right. who can. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, I, I actually wrote it with input from the chief and yeah. Chris. Yeah. So do you want to comment um, then? But I, I, I can, I can basically tell you what, what yeah. we discussed. Right. Um, right, right. So essentially, once council determined that they were going to discuss passing this ordinance um, or potentially passing this ordinance, um, I contacted the other, I think there are six, one, two, three, yeah, the other six um, municipalities who have similar ordinances and they include Upper Arlington, Bexley, Grandview Heights, New Albany, Cleveland, and Powell. Um, I sent emails to all of those communities as well as to Columbus and Euclid, um, and I received information back from Bexley, Powell, and Columbus. None of the other entities responded. Um, I spoke to Mayor uh, Kessler and Bexley. He indicated that their ordinance was passed <coughs> three years ago at the same time that Upper Arlington passed it. 
Upper Arlington does neighbor Bexley. Um, that initiative was driven by uh, residents and medical providers. Um, the, they were proactive. They passed the legislation. They did not contact vendors until after they passed the legislation. Um, but they were proactive in doing public information distribution. Um, they um, have had no complaints uh, about any violations, but they have also not conducted any kind of, um, for lack of a better word, undercover enforcement operations, and enforcement is limited with them. Um, uh, I talked to Ben Baruchowitz with the City of Powell. Um, they did solicit input from the community prior to the passage. Some vendors objected, but it was overwhelmingly supported by most of the business community and the residents. The city did provide informational flyers and stickers to all the businesses that sell tobacco um, and to help uh, public education of the ordinance. And then I spoke to Melissa MacArthur of the Columbus Health Department. Um, she indicated they enacted their legislation in December of 2016 and reached out um, to stakeholders prior to the enactment. The only thing they do is issue advisory letters on confirmed underage buys in response to complaints and investigations, and they have about a 66% compliance, so it's all complaint driven. Um, of the six communities who ordin whose ordinances were reviewed, the penalties were consistent. A first offense of underage sales of any product covered by the ordinance was considered a misdemeanor of the fourth degree. Uh, punishable by zero to 30 days in jail and a fine of $250. Subsequent offenses were considered misdemeanors of the third degree, punishable by zero to 60 days and a fine of up to $500. There were no penalties noted for underage persons who buy or use tobacco products in any of the ordinances that I looked at. And I did pull six ordinances and they, they were all pretty much exactly the same. So as a group chief, Chris and myself, um, our recommendation is this. When laws like this are enacted in local communities and they vary from state statutes that encompasses the, sa that encompass the same subject matter, they are extraordinarily difficult to enforce and present a challenge to implement. If council chooses to enact this legislation, our recommendation would be that we be consistent with other municipalities in using the M4, M3 penalties for illegal sales. If we should choose to enforce against underage people, young people using tobacco products in violation of the law, we suggest a minor misdemeanor cited the mayor's court with an education component. Enforcement would be complaint driven similar to our zoning code enforcement process. I just wanted that to be read because there's two options. There's one, you know, of just enforcing the folks who sell and then there's, then there's the other option which, you know, would be to also be enforcing for the underage user. So I just wanted that to be clear. Okay. Any um, other? Yes. Oh. Yep. Um, I'm employed by the Can you state House. your name, My please? name is Rhonda Kombuski. Yes, hey, Rhonda. I have been employed there since 1990, and I will tell you I have a lot of coworkers with me this evening. Some of us will lose jobs if this is enacted. We card people on a daily basis for using credit cards and we always card for tobacco purchases. And that's a huge part of our business. In 18 to 21, the college age students, that's who we see every day. And they will drive to Fairborn, like Don said. They will drive to Springfield. They will stop coming. <coughs> and some of us will not be employed. So I just want you to see there are faces that will be affected by this decision. So okay. thank you very much. Thanks, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Rhonda, I'm sorry, where do you work? The import house. Okay. Did, did we have another comment? Is uh, that Bob uh, Baldwin? Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, do you mind coming up to the mic so that our live audience can hear you? All right. <laughs> yes, once again, we are live streaming tonight, so you can watch the meeting in real time. <coughs> I'm going to address the concept of that we're designed people freedoms. We live in a civilized society, of course we do. We don't drive 80 miles an hour through town. We don't do this, we don't allow weddings at age 12 year old women. There are a million things we don't do to preserve the quality of civilization. Smoking is not a quality for anybody. Anybody that does not understand the effects of smoking is not on this planet any more than the people that don't understand the effects of global warming. My mother died, she smoked 
as a teenager, got thrown out of two junior colleges in the South. She smoked like a furnace. She died at 61. My son, when he was three, he was picking up every twig, every cigarette butt that dad had. I went to the Kettering Smoking Clinic, toughest thing I ever did in my life. Five nights, uh, I went with Lloyd Benham and Bud Marsh, and we all three quit. Bud uh, Benham started after six months. But anyway, I didn't. Smoking, denying smoking until you're 21 is not a real inconvenience. It's going to hurt some profits, and we have to understand that. Maybe we've got to figure out some other ways to help these vendors. But selling cigarettes to anyone under 21 is not a denial of any freedom that I would sign up to. All right. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay. Another gentleman. Yeah, there. Don, let me get any new comments. Okay, Ben? Uh, my name is Ben Van Osdell. I'm the son-in-law of um, Nippers Corner. Um, I'm up here because um, I'm kind of conflicted because I'm a coach too. So I, you know, I tell my kids not to co um, smoke. Um, but at the same time, I also want a business. Um, but cigarette is something that, you know, convenience stores sell a lot. It's not just the cigarette that we bring in. We bring in all those sales that we make more profit off, which is usually, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old have kids or, or children. They bring in, they get cigarette, but then also their family members purchase other items like pop, um, uh, water, chips, candy, with are more profitable. So if you take that away, and if you know, if, if you own your own business at a convenience store, um, you know, in the summertime, especially in Yellow Springs, we have many, many, so many um, kids that are 21 and under purchasing items from our store. Now, Speedway doesn't care. They have over 3,000 stores. So it's not going to impact that little store if they, you know, disagree on it. But it will impact our family. It will impact, um, you know, our little cost of living. I mean, for us to live on it, it's really going to impact us. Um, but like I said, I'm conflicted because I coach and I also own a business. But the business is part of, cigarette, selling <coughs> cigarette is part of our business. Um, and, you know, when I was growing up, when I, at 18, I tried a cigarette, I said, no way, I'm not smoking. You know, so I don't smoke. Um, but it is our business, and you guys are really hurt our business uh, if you take this away. Okay. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to suggest that we bring it back to council and then go, I mean. Yeah, um, Don, so you, is, is it quick? In terms of time. Okay, yeah, uh, Don just wants, let's let Don ask a quick question. Yep. Uh, Patty, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of the cities or villages or townships, whatever that you surveyed, mm -hmm. did you find any that was our size that then was not being bordered by another town that had enacted an ordinance like this? In other words, anybody kind of like an, in an oasis, pretty much like we would be? Not of, not of the ones that have enacted this, no. Bexley is our size, but they're bordered by Upper Arlington and Upper Arlington Passes. And Columbus, literally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Don. Um, uh, okay. John's <laughs> tall. Well, <laughs> Karen Wintrow. I just, you know, I am no fan of smoking. My mother died from smoking-related um, uh, illness, and so I'm no fan of smoking. And it's uh, not something I am here to support. I'm here to support our businesses. And I do, I am very concerned, I mean, especially the ones that we're talking about. We're talking about the locally owned businesses that are, especially Tom's, that are not necessarily um, being th driven by tourists, by visitors. So I think it's very important that we do everything we can to support them and that carry on business, that, that other business that they're doing when, when folks come in. Uh, making purchases, um, I think that that's an important thing to consider. So I just ask that you take into consideration um, what impact this will have. You have the folks here who are going to be impacted, and, and they're um, pretty serious and, and pretty concerned. So I support them. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, I, and so I think we'll take one more comment from Jane, uh, if you'll come to the mic, and then we'll bring it back to Council. Jane Nipper, Nipper's Corner. Um, 
how is this going to affect our customers that are 21 years, 20 years old? They come in, we know they're over 18. We've already established that. Now we have to ask them, may I see your ID? And they say, well, you know who I am. Yes, I do, but we can't sell because you're not 21 yet. Do you know the crap that we're going to have to take? They're going to be mad. They're really going to be mad. And they'll think we're joking. We're not joking. We'll just say, I'm sorry, the village has passed an ordinance. You have to be 21 to buy cigarettes. They're not going to like it. They're going to go right up to Marathon and take all their business, their beer, their cigarettes, uh, their chips, their gas, all the way up there, or they'll go to Speedway and buy their stuff. We're already in co competition of Speedway. We don't have that little card like Kroger does, like Speedway does. That's a draw. So every sale we make, we try to suggest another thing to make up for what we're losing. That's one thing. We have people that uh, weekend um, visitors, they come in and they, uh, they want their black and the miles, they want their papers, they want their cig uh, cigarettes, and I ask them for their IDs. Well, I left it in the car. Well, you'll have to go get it because we ID here and we're pretty tough about it. And I've heard so many uh, excuses about, I don't have it, uh, it's tattooed on my back, I don't care. <laughs> and I'm going to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you have to be 21 to buy cigarettes here. you got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. It's a law in Yellow Springs. Well, I thought you could do anything in Yellow Springs. I get that anyway, <laughs> but now it's more. No, you have to be 21 to buy cigarettes. I think that's very unfair. If it was federal, I understand and I will abide by it. But we are so small, every penny counts. Um, and and our, our three or four stores, Tom's and, and Don's and the Octopus, we're being penalized because we sell products um, that are not all, federate, all uh, um, federal laws. It's something that we made here. I understand about cigarettes. I grew up with a, a smoker. My dad smoked. My mother died of breast cancer. I know how serious smoking is. I do not smoke. No one in my family smokes, nor do we drink. So I understand the seriousness of this, but I also know that I have to pay bills. And you take <coughs> money out of my store, I get upset. Why do you think I have people on my lot to try to supplement what I can't sell because I have to face um, subway, uh, uh, speedway. A speedway up the street. They already come in and complain that our prices are too high. I'm sorry, we're a mom and pop store. We don't get discounts. So every penny counts. People are going to lose their jobs. Don knows he's got three stores and he's got businesses to run. We just have the one store. You know, we can't move money around, money around, and try to hope to God we make the payroll. Okay. That's my main concern every two weeks right. is making a payroll. And, Jane, that's over three minutes. But I think the point has been well stated by many people. So um, did okay. you, anything else that you? Uh, no, but we're the only store open after 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock maybe. Speedway closes 10-ish most mm -hmm. days. So between 10 and 12, there's no place that you can buy cigarettes. And we get the people from the bars mm -hmm. coming in buying cigarettes after they've been drinking. Okay. So we're the only place. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, uh, we will be discussing this at another meeting, I presume, but we did allow 20 minutes. Um, what? We're not going to discuss it now. Well, I mean, I'm saying we it will come back because we will decide what we're going to do, right? I mean, I, I so if we make legislation, if we will, we are going to make a, a proposal now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there will be. Well, let's just let's yeah. have a discussion. Let's talk yeah. amongst yeah. council. Okay. Yeah, yes. I'd like to talk. <laughs> well, this is a very interesting um, t uh, decision because. You know, you can look at this side, this side, this. I mean, it, it's very interesting. Um, Jessica pointed out, you know, we 
we have cigarettes, which everyone knows are poison, right? They're toxic. We have marijuana. Oh, cigarettes are legal. We have marijuana, which as far as I'm concerned is benign, but it's illegal. So we have this crazy, crazy legal system. If, if I were convinced that um, not selling to people under 21 would have an effect, that would weigh to me more than the loss of income. Because, you know, why, why do we want teenagers having, being poisoned? I, we know. But I am convinced of what people say, that it's real easy to go down the road and get cigarettes. Therefore, I do not think it makes sense for us to have this uh, 21, tobacco 21, for that reason. OK. Um, well, I'm a nurse. I know all about the effects of smoking, and they're bad uh, for everybody. And there is no responsible way to smoke because it is very addictive. So it's, there's very few people who really can control once they start smoking, you know, it's, and it's very hard to quit. We all know that. So, um, however, uh, the way I've been thinking about it is from the point of view of the 18 to 21 year old. And, um, and I guess I feel like, um, I mean, we know alcohol is not great for you in excess, and we know smoking is not good. But um, young people are trying to make responsible decisions. I also do not believe this kind of legislation is going to change behavior. If it did, that would be different. If it was federal, that would be different, or state even. But um, so I don't quite see, and, it, and there's some message to young people about, uh, you know, trying, that I also don't like, that feels kind of, What's the word I want? Patronizing, maybe, or something like that. Um, you know, we need to try to educate our young people. Most people, I, I don't know, I think generally most young people who are smoking had that uh, example in their family. A lot of times, you know, people who smoke, their parents smoke, and those, those kind of uh, examples uh, tend to, you know, can uh, affect young people smoking also. So. I guess at this point, I'm, you know, we have put legislation for, we have um, posted in our, uh, in our parks that we don't want people smoking there. I think that's a good, that's a good and responsible thing to do. But in terms of this, I just, yeah, you don't, you don't even have to go, what, two miles till you get to a place where you're going to buy cigarettes. So I don't really see, I think we just need to really, you know, the schools, the coaches, educate. Uh, and encourage our young people not to smoke. It's not good for your health. But people do a lot of things that aren't good for their health. And so. Kevin, did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for every, to everyone who came out and um, spoke so passionately about this. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, in addition, I think we're all in agreement uh, about the health <coughs> benefits. I, I, I suspect that smokers know more about the negative benefits of smoking than non-smokers do. Um, but I think what's critical, something I found out that was news to me as we started this discussion, is, is the addictive nature or the addictive tendencies with respect to younger people. So, um, you know, I, I, would, I would think that we would probably not do nothing. Uh, and the something I think that we can do is really to focus on the education side of things. Um, and again, what's key is not, again, we all know smoking is bad. But again, introducing addictive uh, items uh, or items that can lead to, 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 to addiction to those younger bodies is what's really key. And I think, you know, if we really do a good job of, of, of pushing that message, it's sort of a, a compromise, if you will. But, um, and again, I think if we have that information and really uh, comprehend it, you know, our minds can go one way or the other in terms of the making making some decisions. But so again, I I, I I again appreciate the passion of folks come out. Um, I will admit that uh, I, I hadn't fully considered you know the economic impact to the local businesses, and I'll, I will allow that uh, because I was like, wow, eighteen twenty one that that's the prime age for folks getting addicted on things. I mean, that's a, there's a strong argument there. So uh, again, I think we'll end up on the uh, we can err on the side of education. Absolutely, and then um, see what happens after that, I think. Okay, Lisa? Yeah. Um, I've, I've spent a significant amount of time in the last two weeks or so 
um, thinking about this issue and talking to citizens, both uh, people who I don't know and people who I do know, and also on social media. Um, I've talked to people from all different age groups, uh, people who smoke and who don't smoke, and um, uh, people with children. And so first I'd like to address my findings from that, kind of informal, because I feel like part of my responsibility as a council person is to not just enforce like my opinion, but also to try to listen to the perspectives of the community. And then I, I would also like to comment on my own opinion um, a little bit. Uh, so um, the overwhelming majority of people that I've um, spoken to about this issue um, say, wow, yeah, smoking's really bad for you and we're absolutely against this legislation. Um, I think that th they didn't use the word, but that word <coughs> oasis is a really important word to describe Yellow Springs and both the impact on the community and people talked about the financial impact and the other thing people talked about was just this implication that we're rolling back rights. So it was always done in the context of, yes, cigarette smoking is very bad for you, but we don't think we should do this in Yellow Springs because of our size and that we're so isolated. So I heard that loud and clear. I have something in common on a personal side with Judith. I'm also a nurse. I'm a PhD prepared nurse. And so the way I make sense of things in addition to talking to people is to go and read the literature. You know, and, and in, in some ways the literature is um, really compelling, um, but again, I don't find a comparison to the impact that a village the size of Yellow Springs can really have. Like you, Mr. Nipper, if this was a statewide initiative, I would be saying absolutely I'm in favor for, of it. But I think that we can't have the impact that the data show in a community this size. So I do think that I was really glad to hear that you're taking a hard line on enforcement because one of, the, one of the things in the data is that the majority of 15 to 17 year olds who start smoking are getting their tobacco from 18 to 20 year olds and presumably if you're over 21, you won't buy tobacco for a 15 to 17 year old. I'm not sure that I really buy that. I think they're in, still in colleges together, but I think enforcement and education are really, really important. Um, so thanks for all the time to talk, but at this point I do not think legislation makes sense and if it was brought before me I would vote against it. Okay, thanks Lisa. So um, I'm going to express what I've heard and with the qualification that I understand a few more people want to speak but for this council hearing the same comments by uh, multiple people is not what we're looking for. Once we've heard the comments we understand and, and we accept those and so what I've heard is that council in general is opposed to uh, the legislation. Um, Patty has, uh, has brought forward an idea, which I think um, is something we should consider, which is a resolution showing our support for state legislation for Tobacco 21. Uh, and that is something that I would like to suggest that we do bring back um, because uh, the main arguments that I've heard and from what I've heard that other council members are compelled by is that just doing it in our small town when it's not applied to the county and beyond is problematic. And um, that is someone, somewhat compelling to me. I will say I take issue with the idea that anyone has the right to smoke because it is so bad for your health. But that aside, I have to look at the overall impact of this kind of legislation. So um, I would like to close the discussion with that proposal unless somebody really thinks they have a comment that has not been addressed, but I think we've heard it. All right, so I'm, I'm willing to let you come up to the mic then and please make it an original statement. My name is Matt Raska and this is clearly an escalation of the drug war, which has been a total failure since the 60s, as well as a heir to prohibition, which was also a total failure in the 30s. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, um, I put a proposal on the table. Is that something that counts? A motion. Okay, so I'd like to move that we bring uh, a resolution in support of a statewide Tobacco 21 bill. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thank you for the discussion, and I also appreciate, Shernaz, everything that you brought to us about this as well. 
it's a really important issue uh, for everybody. Uh, Brian, can I just clarify though, just this, by, by uh, approving that motion, we are also saying that at this point we are not moving forward as a council with legislation to raise the legal age to buy tobacco and tobacco products to 21. Yes. In Yellow Springs. That is correct. And was there anything that uh, Kevin was suggesting more education? I don't know if, if you were suggesting that. I think that should be part of our discussion next time okay. because we've That's talked about this for 45 minutes. Okay. Um, so with that, I know some of you are going to leave. Please keep in mind we have to keep the door open. So uh, if you are going to leave, take the conversations downstairs. <laughs> and with that, um, we're going to move on to the mayor's court recommendation from the Justice System Task Force. And uh, Judith, if you could open that discussion. Yes. I'll wait one second here while people leave. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> oh, nice. You got a live stream watcher. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Karen said she was watching. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, so she came for that discussion. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the next discussion is about the um, resolution Justice System Task Force uh, brought to Village Council uh, about the Mayor's Court. And hang on a minute here, I'm looking for, I've managed to lose. Um, so, um, and the resolution was to basically um, anything that could come to mayor's court would be cited to mayor's court, any citations. That was the resolution. Um, and I wanted to just start out, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit, and then Steve, who is our spokesperson, and Dave, who is one of the members of the, um, uh, the mayor's court uh, working group, are going to speak. And then we'll get in and, and maybe hear from uh, other members of the task force who might ha have anything additional to say, and then we'll open it up for discussion. I've asked for 30 minutes on this, so it's not just 20 minutes. Okay. So um, I just wanted to, uh, I went back to uh, the resolution that established the Justice System Task Force, and I just wanted to note that the Yellow Springs Village Council, when we uh, established the Justice System Task Force, we, we made a commitment to a new goal that involves re review uh, of an update of the village justice system. And that, um, that new goal really came out of a national discussion that um, was about the huge level of incarceration of our, of our nation, so it was a national conversation, uh, the impact of race and the huge level of incarceration of people of color, and, um, and also the issue of the disparate, this terrible disparate impact on poor people uh, when they get caught up in the, in the criminal justice system. I feel very fortunate, our council, our village council, our community, our staff, including our uh, police department, uh, we see it as a responsibility that we have to depart from and try to solve in our small way of a small community these problems. And so part of what the Justice System Task Force is doing is trying to bring more information. We're doing the research and bring uh, ideas that we have to start to solve some of those problems. We do not think we have to just accept this level of injustice in our justice system. And so and I think we're very lucky that we have this buy-in, uh, really, from the whole community and from our staff. <coughs> um, one thing that we wanted to be sure is that when we brought a resolution to council that it was that it was well researched and so um, one of our members brought this what at the time seemed a little cumbersome but i think in the end was a very excellent idea that we would do a notice and comment because you know we did some thinking about an issue uh, we should be in conversation with our police department and our mayor about the, that that idea uh, and then we had this very official thing we we're doing, which is a notice and comment uh, uh, process in which we noticed we are considering uh, that recommending to council that they pass a resolution, uh, you know, basically mandating that what can come to uh, mayor's court is cited to mayor's court by our police department. Um, we we put that in the paper to get public comment. We noticed it in the. Yellow Springs Police Department, I brought the notice to our chief um, to actually 
post it in you know the department. So if there were individuals uh, in the police department uh, that had comments, that they could do that, um, as well as our chief. And um, and we were in conversation with the mayor, who participated in one of our discussions uh, about this proposal. And I know there were some private conversations. I was a part of one of them, so all of that happened. Um, this was the first time we kind of did this official notice and comment uh, pr uh, process. And I will say that um, it obviously did not garner the information that we had hoped to have before we made our final recommendation. Because in the packet now, we have you know, our recommendation and then uh, both the chief and, and, and I think we tried to address, at least I thought I was addressing Pam's wanting to hold off for six months, but I think we maybe were a little bit ships passing in the night because what I had suggested and what the committee had agreed to, which was a six month, um, uh, that we wait six months. I had understood it. We wait six months and then it's implemented, but I think Pam evidently meant something slightly different so from her comments. So that's all I want to say about it, uh, just to, uh, I think it's a very good process. I do want to say that, and I think we need to tighten up that process so we get those comments ahead of time in the future. But anyway, I want to give the floor now to Steve, who is our spokesperson, and to Dave Turner, who's, they're doing a tag team thing, I hear. All right. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, the hat I'm wearing today is a spokesperson for the Justice System Task Force. I really don't have much more to say than that. I didn't realize you were going to the full oh. opening. Like that's a, oh, okay, I would sorry. say that that would be the best intro. Um, I would just add that I'd like to thank Laura Carlos for her expertise and time, uh, being as one of the committee, uh, people on the committee with, to help out with uh, Dick Turner. Um, but the research is there. Uh, the numbers show that they've declined and they're already showing that they're on an upswing. Um, it's as though the chief has already started listening to this recommendation, uh, but clearly, like it was said, that the there does seem to be something else in the report of maybe some other questions. So, um, if we're uh, if you'd like to address, I'm curious as to what you, how you would address that. I spoke with um, with the chief, and we just sort of kind of you just kind of gave a very positive. We're already well above not just looking into it, but starting to implement the concept of what people are talking about they'd like to see and, and sort of immediately. Um, however, I, we still believe that implementing this plan uh, for council to go through with would be very important, um, but still absolutely want to make sure that we're not stepping on the toes of the chief. And so I'd like to hear a couple of other things in this discussion because it was kind of blindsided, so I'd like to see sort of what else, but I still think it's extremely important. And it is something we've been since day one uh, wanting to implement and making sure that the mayor's court um, was back and up and running the way it previously had. <coughs> David, like to All right, thanks, Steve. All right, David Turner. Oh, how many ways should I do this? Um, I would like to say that there are, we have four recommendations we're mentioning. We're talking about one recommendation here, which has made it to the task force the second time uh, in a year. Uh, and uh, we have several, and they all, I think, work together. You know, a diversion program is something that we've been recommending. I was talking with the chief earlier. He said they've already started doing some of those kind of things. So this recommendation doesn't really stand on its own. Uh, and I think it's important uh, to see that. I also think it's important that these recommendations are be seen as recommendations. Uh, Marianne made a great suggestion a year ago in the May 1st meeting, I think it was, saying we sh you guys should create a box, put all the recommendations in it, and then when you get all of them, figure out what to do because of the interaction of them and you might do something that's gonna have an effect on something else you've already done. So if you look at them as a group, you can better avoid doing things like that. And some of the things that we're recommending with diversion and uh, this mayor's court recommendation that we're talking about tonight work together like that. Another aspect of this that I think is very important is that we're making a recommendation and the people downstream have to make the plans of what actually is gonna be done. Um, 
unless you want us to be very specific from the time we show up with a recommendation with everything already worked out so all you do is see a gay verily go do it, then um, I, don't, I don't think that's going to work. Just like the taser policy, you know, people in the task force recommended something and the police and others got together with task force people and finally came up with a taser policy which worked. This is the same kind of a thing, I believe. So with that in mind, on May 1st last year, I said, and I looked it up on the video because I'm that kind of guy, <laughs> we recommend the village manager direct the police chief to send all possible cases to mayor's court. Now a year and two weeks later, I'm saying the same thing, only it's got whereases and here on two fours in front of it. Now therefore be it resolved that the village manager is directed to work with the chief of police to ensure all misdemeanors that can be charged to mayor's court are charged to mayor's court unless jurisdiction is otherwise placed in another court by law do it by November 1st of this year. And um, get a quarterly report on how many are coming so we can tell whether it's happening. So a year ago, we said this. I'm saying it again from probably the same podium to pretty much the same people. And it means pretty much the same thing. <coughs> My personal view is downstream that the things need to be fleshed out. And some of the concerns that you've raised, and well, yours are taken care of, Pam, by we give you another six months. Uh, and you talked about chief, I think, uh, can be, you know, can be dealt with by looking at these things as a group, as well as um, people uh, who are involved in it, uh, looking at all of the things at once. So that's what I have to say about this and in general. And I would encourage the council to provide us with some more guidance about what form you want things to come to you in. So we don't spend a lot of time doing work, coming with something and then hearing, well, why don't you Think about this thing that we didn't tell you we wanted, we wanted you to think about. So what else can I say to make your day better? <laughs> uh, that you'll pass the mic to the next speaker. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that, thank you, David. I think that was clear. Um, we do have two other members of the task force, and so, uh, or three other members. And I see um, it's almost just like Okay. So, um, I apologize for uh, getting the uh, data analysis relevant to this proposal out only yesterday. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have had a chance to review it. Um, however, you know it's evident that at least as recently as, as 2017, um, that. Uh, you know, 79 or 59 percent of the license registration and insurance citations were being cited to municipal court, and 83 um, percent or 15 of the equipment violations were being cited. I'm sorry, not mayor's court to municipal court, um, and 15 or 83 percent of the uh, equipment violations were being cited to municipal court. Also, um, and then I, I also just wanted to clarify a little bit about the the process here. Um, we we did uh, adopt. Um, actually two different policies trying to anticipate the, the problem of um, having incomplete recommendations. Uh, the recommendation uh, development guidelines, um, which proactively encourages our members to um, contact the police chief, um, any stakeholders, the, ma uh, the mayor, um, regarding their opinions about our, um, uh, about the recommendation that, the, that they're developing. And indeed, um, when it was presented to us, uh, the Mayor's Court Working Group stated that Chief Carlson was in support of this recommendation. Um, that was the understanding of JSTF at the time. Um, I guess uh, Carlson could probably explain that a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know if you want to say anything, or do, do you want to wait until later? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to finish your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then I just wanted to say that I guess at the time I did feel that this recommendation was going too far. So I proposed an amendment um, to basically retain discretion for assault, aggravated menacing, menacing by stalking, aggravated trespass, telecommunications harassment, victim or witness intimidation, sexual imposition, and hazing. Um, of those, assault, menacing, and uh, by stalking, and uh, aggravated trespass are already um, must go to municipal court if the victim is a family member or household member. Um, not the, the victim or anyone involved is, you know, family member or the household member, you know, with the, with the perpetrator. 
makes it up. But you know what I'm mean. you know what I'm saying. If it's like a domestic violence kind of situation. Cohabitation. Cohabitation, exactly. Um, and I feel like that's probably a good framework for moving forward. I feel like there, you know, if the 2017 data is any evidence, there's still a lot of things that um, I think people feel ought to be going to mayor's court that are still going to the municipal court, um, but that there are other things that perhaps it does make sense to retain officer discretion for. And so my own position is that it would be nice to send it back to committee and try to um, hear the, the concerns in full from the, from the police um, and try to understand, to sort of more narrowly tailor the recommendation. Okay, thanks John. Um, are we ready to hear from uh, Mayor Canine or the Chief? I'm happy to Okay, to Mayor? Pam Canine, Yellow Springs Mayor. Uh, John, thank you for your comments. I want to branch off and build on a couple Where? of things you just said okay. that I find to be of interest. I want to thank the Justice System Task Force for their valuable and insightful work that they've given to our community. They've made a recommendation to council that Dave quoted all misdemeanors that can be charged to mayor's court be charged to mayor's court unless uh, jurisdiction is otherwise placed in another court by law. John outlined what some of those cases are. At this point in time, I am not in favor as uh, the mayor of the village manager directing the police chief to ensure that all cases, emphasis on all cases which are eligible to come before the mayor's court be directed there. It's my feeling that officer discretion in the field as to where a case is cited seems to be working currently and may in fact ultimately help the defender. And here's why. During my own learning curve since taking office on January 1st through discussions and meetings with various Greene County Municipal Court lawyers and judges, I've learned there are many resources available to some defendants whose cases are adjudicated in Zenia, especially in the areas of mental health and chemical dependency that are not as easily available to them in Yellow Springs. Services through the Xenia Court can be provided quickly and with support and with follow-up. So, why not start these services here, some might ask. And instead of growing our <coughs> bureaucracy, which would include an increase in personnel costs and costs for additional services, the mayor's court wants to utilize current community-based local resources that fit the culture of our community in a cost-effective way. That was the platform on which I ran. It was the platform on which I was elected to be the mayor of the village. Now, I'd like to remind the council there are many individuals relating to the mayor's court who are relatively new to their position. We have a new mayor, a new chief of police, relatively new, new clerk of court, new community outreach specialist. This, what I call a confluence of newness, hasn't happened historically in our village government, at least based on my research. I can assure the council it's a new day in mayor's court. We have increased communications with the police department, including clarifications and expectations procedures. Technology has been updated and is being used effectively. The addition of the outreach specialist is opening the door to positive interventions and assistance to those who might otherwise end up in front of the mayor's court. We're all fine-tuning our interactions with each other, and in my opinion, it is working. Dave's addition to his reading tonight of Do It By November 1st was a critical part of my consideration of this recommendation. At minimum, Mayor's Court simply requests additional time before the council considers the recommendation before them from the Justice System Task Force, his first recommendation. The task force did agree to a six-month <coughs> extension, which Dave mentioned tonight at a recent meeting, and I am simply making a plea that that timeline be followed. Now, in addition to that, too, this would give us a full year of data sets going forward that we could examine from 2018 onward, which is what I'm interested in. Historical data is useful, but it also 
reflects, if we start going back over a decade, we're looking at prior police administrations, prior chiefs, prior officers who are no longer with the village. I'm interested in January 1 onward <coughs> for the bulk of our examination for this question. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Kinnine. Uh, Laura. Thank you very much. I've spent probably 50 hours on this. And the problem is police discretion. That doesn't mean every officer is bad. It doesn't mean that there, aren't, there isn't good training going on or that we don't have a good chief with a good heart. Here's what officer discretion has meant for this village in the last four years. And I thank John for his good work with these statistics. How many disorderly conduct cases were heard by mayor's court in the last four years? None. How many marijuana possession or, or paraphernalia cases were heard in our mayor's court? None. Two less. Well, you've got 2013 to 2017 on this. But I, I read that there's eight. With 54, with 54 cases, illegal use of possession, marijuana, drug paraphernalia, all in Muni court. Oh. Okay. okay. Oh, uh. Tail lights, illumination of rear license plate, two lighted lights display. Those cases all apparently had to be heard by a Muni court judge and not a mayor's court. By the way, lawyers know that those kind of cases are often called pretext stops. Driving while black, driving while young. We cannot <coughs> start to change justice in this community until we can actually have our own mayor hear these kind of cases. The vast majority of the over, of all the cases in the last four years, more than half of them were sent to Muni Court. And let me tell you, you do not want to go there. There's a lot of reasons for that. The judge, the way they do things, the cost down there, the difficulty of negotiating any kind of plea, the lack of caring about factual basis, the, the, the fact that you get into a system that is way more punitive than what we could do here. I could go on and on. And then some of the most, most dis, um, politically charged cases, obstruction of justice, resisting arrest, none of those came to our own mayor, including some cases out of the New Year's Eve incident, which is partly how I got involved. And I got involved by, by representing individuals who I, I, I just immediately asked myself, why is this case not in mayor's court? Why in the world? Yellow Springs citizen, Yellow Springs property, Yellow Springs this, Yellow Springs that, and why are we in Xenia? And then the more I looked at what statistics I found, I realized a whole bunch, these aren't oddball cases, that this is happening a lot across chiefs, across officers coming and going. Why is this happening? I think it's happening for a lot of reasons. You get young officers, you get new officers, they, know, they get trained at OPADA in the revised code. They don't get the same, you know, they need a cheat sheet for our um, parallel ordinance. I think setting the tone that you all could do by passing this resolution will set the tone. We want those cases here so we can do, dispense Yellow Springs justice, which hopefully is kinder, gentler, more understanding kind of justice. Plus, hopefully we do a diversion program and, and really ramp up the kind of justice we want to see here. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Laura. Uh, Chief Carlson. Good evening, Excuse me. Chief Brian Carlson. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Justice System Task Force in the passion. I've been in discussion with them since uh, I became interim chief. Some things I'd like to tell you that are factual and haven't been discussed this evening. We uh, have literally been working in <coughs> a new administration with a mayor for four months. The new mayor didn't begin mayor's court until the end of January. 
I have 2018 stats. Um, in January, with a new mayor, we heard 59% of all cases that came through the police department. February, it jumped to 83%. March, 79%. We're currently working on the stats for April. We're a month behind in our progression. But the numbers are showing that we are doing what we've discussed. I understand the ill effects of previous administrations on the public. The reality is I've been in this position for less than a year as permanent chief of police. I'm simply requesting that you give us more time to look at a full year of data with the new administration. Within the last few days with the mayor's office, we've been working on a program that Ann and the mayor have put together with the police department to adjudicate and have disposition in cases that can be through mediation, which the mayor has already accomplished in a case, through work with our social worker, which is already in process, and to work with the police department on understanding resolution-oriented policing, which is, I think, why I'm here. I'm on the same side of the argument as the Justice System Task Force, but I do have issue with being mandated to make my decisions. And I'm speaking as me, as an officer. I am on the front lines. I am arriving on scene to save a life. <coughs> I am understanding the totality of circumstances in the cases that I hear. I've said it and I can't, I know that it becomes a continuing discussion, if you will, but this is gonna take time. The police department in Yellow Springs, specifically, we didn't end up where we are at the, in 2017 overnight. It took time. It's going to take time to climb out. What I am interested in is how things are going now, currently. And I feel very positive and confident in the direction that the department has taken. I appreciate the hard work John has done on the statistics, but to me, and don't take this the wrong way, but those don't matter. It's, we have a new mayor in 2018, a new administration, and where are those numbers? And I'm, that's what I'm telling you now, they are growing. And we're looking real good. When we say 79% of cases, all cases sent to mayor's court in March, that's probably close to 100% of what can go. I'm working on the stats, Patty has asked me, but what cases did we send to mayor's court that, or did we send a municipal that could have come to mayor's court? And I can tell you it's on one hand, I can count the cases. And they fall into the categories of what we can't send to mayor's court. So I'm simply asking, and it sounds like John and Dave both kind of and Steve, we're on the same playing field that I think the dialogue needs to open now where we have these discussions. I can present in private consult why this particular case didn't go and explain that. I can't do that in a public forum. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense? Yes. I'm extremely tired. And yes. Really sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you, Chief. Any questions or anything? No. Thank you for hearing. So, are we, yes? Uh, I didn't know if you wanted Chris to say anything. Well, I mean, we do have Chris's report. Uh, are we ready to discuss this council a little bit? I mean, I've, I've, I've heard some great comments myself. So why don't I start? Um, uh, <laughs> see? All right. There are two things that are important to me because um, some issues came out recently um, that, I'll be honest, I was a little bit frustrated that we never really dug down on some of the key issues 
for, and we've discussed this for several years now, and finally, you know, I'm, I'm starting to hear things that impact my decision. So there are two things that are important to me. One is understanding what kinds of cases need those county services and, you know, just how many of those are coming through our mayor's court or could potentially come through our mayor's court. Um, this kind of, you know, highlights what Laura is saying, you know, so I want to understand that piece of the statistics. The other thing that I didn't hear mentioned but I thought was compelling is uh, the potential for us to be responsible for the cost of incarceration. So again, I want the same understanding. What potential do we have to be hearing those cases in mayor's court? That will help me decide, but I do think the, the idea that everyone's on the same page of taking a little bit more time is also resonating with me. Um, but those are the two issues that I really want to fully understand to be convinced whether discretion makes sense or not. Okay? So I came on council in 2014, and I think it was probably before I came on council that I think I recall Judith talking about how uh, village council really had taken a back seat in terms of uh, the police, even though you know we are the governing body of the village. So um, I was impressed by that, and one of the first things I did when I came on council was re suggest that we get off of the drug task force, request that we get off of the drug task force, and we did that. Um, and then, as you, most people probably know, I was intimately involved in the New Year's Eve debacle, so I experienced that. The justice system task, and I also worked with Judith to get the justice system task force started. The Justice System Task Force was actually started before the New Year's Eve incident, and we had our previous chief at that point. And after the Justice System Task Force, Brian was uh, appointed acting chief. I think that since Brian, well, no, I think that since we've had, uh, at least Brian and I and Judith, the council that we have, and <coughs> Brian and I came on in 2014, council had begun to start saying, okay, we want to take responsibility for what's happening with the police department and we want to change the culture. I think since Brian uh, Carlson has been chief, the, co the culture has been changing. I, um, I think that in some ways this recommendation from the Justice Task Force is a recommendation that had we had the former chief of police, I would have said, yeah, do it, because it's clearly not happening. But I do think the culture is changing, and I would rather put our emphasis into telling the chief we want all cases that can go to mayor's court, that reasonably should go to mayor's court, go there, unless there is some compelling reason. And I would rather trust that the chief is educating <coughs> the troops on that than to basically not trust the officers to have that discretion. I think that the officers should have discretion, so I do not support the recommendation as it is stated. I do think that council wants to definitely give the police chief, well, our village manager and the police department the understanding that we want any cases that are reasonably to go to mayor's court should go to mayor's court. Both the chief and the mayor, I think, have said they support officer discretion and I um, am swayed by their statement. Kevin? Ditto. Um, you know, Chief and Pam, they're, they're doing what we're asking them to do, um, and I think they were doing it before, you know, any hints of a resolution came about. I think, uh, to Pam's point, she came into office, and uh, I believe Chief did as well, with these kind of, kind of things in mind. Um, 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, smart people hire smart people. That's what Steve Jobs says, uh, said. Um, and I think that's what we've done. And we've got good people uh, doing the jobs. Um, and, you know, I think we, we let folks do what they want to do, with what they're hired to do, rather. Um, and, and I think mo morale is important, um, you know, across the board uh, in, in the police force. I think uh, everybody wants to feel that they're supported um, and, and being heard and, uh, and that what they're doing makes a difference. So, again, I think we, uh, some people call it, we are in violent agreement. You know, we are all saying the right things. We're all, I think the right things are being done. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know that we, I don't, I, I, I do know. We do not, in my opinion, need to mandate that the people who are doing good work continue to do good work. So I support uh, Chief Carlson and Pam in what they are doing and would uh, just with all of my might encourage you to keep being who you are and doing what you're doing. All right, Lisa. Um, I, I'd like to thank all, I, there's the number of hours that have been put into this, like particularly highlighting that this began over a year ago. And the cumulative numbers of hours that have been spent on this, I think need to be recognized. Um, uh, piggybacking off what, what you've said, Kevin, um, it to me is the problem of not getting to some point where we have legislation. Um, smart people hire smart people, yet people who got us to where we were, which is where we didn't want to be, were hired in this village, right? So either we're saying that those people weren't smart, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that we can count on that. So my concern always is that um, right now we're in a great, we're in a good place, you know. We have our chief, we have a, a you know, the mayor in place, we have the capacity to have a mayor's court. But just as these people have changed, so could they change again. And so unless I think we have something that reflects the village values that we can communicate to our community, as well as our police, I think we're running a risk in the long run of having erosion from the direction that I think everyone in this room wants to head. So, um, and, and again, this is not a saying that either Chief, what you're saying about <coughs> discretion isn't important, or Pam, what you're saying isn't important. And in fact, I at this point don't support saying there's you know no discretion. But I I was surprised that that the justice system task force and these reports didn't seem to be connecting together um, when we came here tonight and. So I do wonder if there may be some threshold by which we say, uh, you know, set some, you know, license registration and insurance. You know, I mean, I want to unpack why is there, what's going on behind the discretion? Is it indicating a lack of confidence in the mayor's court? What, why are the police, you know, having that discretion for certain things that are very low risk? I don't know. So I'd like to have it go back to, um, the commission. One other point uh, to my to my point that I think we need to move towards something legislation is I get your point, Mayor, about the confluence of newness, but all of like you, I'm serving a two-year term, right? I know the learning curve I'm climbing. I imagine you're climbing that learning curve too, and you know, in two years you might not be the mayor. So if every two years we have a six-plus month learning curve while the new person gets up to date, then we're going to have dips in our justice system. So just newness, to me, is not a reason to not move forward with, with courage since this has been going on for over a year. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, Judith. Okay. Um, so I'd like to suggest a couple things. I mean, uh, just open discretion uh, is what, uh, you know, um, is I'm opposed to that. I am very opposed to that. Um, to me, 
having discretion about sending license registration insurance. Now, maybe I'm, we don't know what 2018 is. I'm just looking at 2017. I'm not looking at 2013 to 2017. Uh, so I'm just 79 of those went to municipal court equipment violations. You know, these are not these are not violent crimes at all. Uh, so you know, but so I think there's actually if there's a way to simply uh, the thing we want to get at is if you're poor and you didn't have insurance because you couldn't afford it and then you got stopped and of course you know I've talked to the chief and he talks about the rabbit hole that people frequently and especially poor people fall into and cannot climb out of because they do not have the resources so what we need to know is okay when it goes to I feel like something there's some information that if we can gather it in a simple way would give the mayor the chief as he's talking to his police officers and the JSDF and council um, help us to make some important decisions. I think we need to make some differentiations around discretion. You know, it's one thing to have a discretion. You're in a situation that's like an acute problem and an officer needs to make a, 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 a second, you know, a quick uh, decision and you don't want to necessarily second guess that uh, depending on what happens, you know. But in terms of what court they go to, um, if they're getting, so, you know, but I take you know, the, the point that if there's some services that's going to help people, great. So what are the services, for example, for license registration and insurance violations that someone would get at municipal court? Now, I'm not saying that's still happening in 2018. Hopefully it's not. But I would like to know what are the services. It'll help Pam and our, uh, and, Flo and Florence, Florence, uh, you know, uh, it'll help all of us know how do we get some of that support if there's a possibility of getting the support here. Our, you know, if police officers are sending cases to municipal court, and this is the municipal court that we're talking about, with the idea that this person needs services, are they getting them? It would be good to know what are the services that they're getting. What do they have to pay? What's the cost when you go to Xenia Municipal Court? I know when Mary Ann went to Xenia Municipal Court for the New Year's Eve thing, she luckily had a pro bono lawyer if you're, you know, so, you know, it can be quite costly. And uh, so that's, so, so to know what it costs to go there versus to go to the mayor's court. Um, I, the, the under, the overarching issue is this, to me, is the disparate impact on poor people. And part of doing, uh, getting this better information, because our police officers, you know, I'm just going to say we are, you know, believing that they care and that's why they are police officers. They are trying to help people. But, you know, my guess is they've got some ideas of, yeah, there's some things that go on. I see it because I'm in part of this that are unjust to poor people. They must see that, you know. But what's to be done about it? What role can they play? And this is all, as we all get better informed, it will help our chief to say, you know, when you're using discretion, say it's a, a violent crime or, I don't know, OVI or something like that, you know, how, how do, can we do this? It's the least detrimental to the person that's going to most help them. And so you're having this conversation in your department where everybody's kind of getting on the same page, not that individual circumstances aren't always different in these cases, but a way of thinking about it. And that's the kind of conversation if we have better information. So I have a list of things. If it's sent to Xenia Municipal, one of the things I wanted to ask is, can we ask the police officer who does makes that decision to write a very short paragraph, why? Why did you make that decision? So we can understand what's the thinking behind it. If there's a good reason, great. We need to understand it, you know. And I think this could be help, very helpful to the chief, I would think. Um, what services, like I say, you send them there for services, did they get them? How much did it cost them, you know, to have to go, to have to defend in the municipal court? Um, so that we, you know, the, um, what's the cost at the mayor's court? Um, and this whole, again, getting back to, you know, there's some things where there's always going to be, there always has to be some discretion. There's just no, you know, that's just part of it, the job. It's, but, you know, there's some areas where maybe discretion doesn't make sense and we want to differentiate that. So mm -hmm. I think if we can gather more information and have the support of the staff, you know, Patty and the chief, uh, of finding ways to get this information and, and the mayor too, because the municipal, I know you've been asking for information there. If we could, if the committee could, you know, kind of gather, this is the information we need, because if we're going to do a year's worth of 
data collection, we need some more detail to it. And um, mm -hmm. that's the way I feel. And then that will help to, I think it will help the chief and it will help everybody. And so we can get, you know, behavioral change if, if that's needed without all the, all the attending uh, difficulties that these, you know, when people get in trouble with the law that can just be very hard to. I mean, there's a, there's a great <coughs> report, uh, I brought it with me, ACLU, how Ohio's debtors' prisons are ruining lives and costing communities, and uh, the outskirts of hope is what it's called. And, um, you know, there's a book that we're looking at and the disparate impacts on poor people uh, and how we ameliorate that called It's Not a Crime to be Poor. There's, there's a lot written. ACLU's done a tremendous job. This is about Ohio. And there's actually, it actually went after a mayor's court that was sending people to jail who could not pay their fines. And I know Pam's not going to do that, but, <laughs> but you know, it's just, and it's not very far from here. It's a town not very far from here. Um, who's doing that? And it and they talk about individual people, personal stories, young families, where they're you know, it's just uh, causing a lot of havoc potentially in people's lives. And of course, we're not doing that, but we want to do it as best as we can to the opposite of that. So I guess just to summarize, I want to reiterate: this has been a great discussion. This is the first time that I think we've really gone beyond just like, you know, this this flat statement of whatever goes to mayor's court goes to mayor's court and we're starting to look at the nuances and that's what I think I'm hearing there's some consensus I don't, I don't really see two sides anymore I see that we need some more time we need some more research as part of why we need that time we need to refine what this means in terms of you know some guidelines around what you know the discretion is about right so there are things that obviously should go to mayor's court there have been some good points raised about why they should not and so as lisa and judith both pointed out putting that in a clear framework i think is important it will help with training it will help the police department as a whole do what chief carlson wants uh to happen so uh i think it's a great discussion and it sounds like uh we will revisit this and yes I would just like to have some clarification on who is supposed to gather what information because there are a lot of things that why don't we why don't you and I maybe sure chief that. and I don't know if Lisa wants to be a part of it sit down together and kind of look at this and okay. and maybe the mayor too because really it's um, partly um, stuff we need to get from Xenia and I think as a municipality we shouldn't have to beg for that information and, you know or and I don't know how we do it there is a request out from the clerk yeah. for information from Xenia, and she's quite adept at this, so okay. she, she she's may be good, the yeah. perfect, perfect person. Okay. okay. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks, Mayor. So we'll have a discussion. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the discussion. And um, we are going to move forward because I do want to uh, complete at least our uh, discussion on fees for event services. Um, and Patty. I guess you are leading that one off. I guess I am. Let me get to that point. Um, so um, again, this, what is in your packets tonight is just uh, the same information that you've had in previous packets. It's a reiteration um, from February of uh, the different things that we do charge for or the different things that we supply services for that we do not charge for, what those services are and apparent, uh, approximately what they would cost us. Um, keep in mind that these are uh, staff hours only. It's not anything to do with any rental on equipment or wear and tear on anything. Um, and then you also have our recommendation uh, for potential charges if that's the way council uh, wants to go. Um, if your event is estimated by the village to cost less than $200, there would be no charge from the village unless you have it on village property, in which case the established rental fees would apply. If your event requires strictly staff time and the amount that exceeds $200, you'll be charged for the staff time at a rate of $25 an hour per employee for anything that exceeds $200. Um, if you require temporary electric, it's $100 per panel. Hanging large banners is $150 per occurrence. And small banners is $10 per occurrence, and I apologize for the on. Okay. Um, so we had some great information in the packet. We've had a couple discussions around this issue right now. I guess the first thing is I, I think council should articulate any questions.
questions or comments that we have and then maybe that will direct. I know Karen and Alex are here to answer any questions. Um, but I guess honestly, I, th I, think, I think we've been presented pretty clearly with the information. So um, yes, Lisa. So Brian, I'm going to interrupt you with something totally off topic on okay. the unlikely chance that I'm on camera down here. I'm sending really clear body language of sitting with my back to the council. That's because I have a broken foot, <laughs> and my foot is up on a lift over here. So if we're having conversation, I'm sitting like this. <laughs> this does not mean anything. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but I really felt it was important to mention. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So um, do we have any particular questions, comments about this issue? Um, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. go, yeah. Marianne? Um, it, it, when we look at the various events, the main one that stands out is the street fair. I mean, the zo zombie walk is actually not inexpensive, um, but the main one that stands out is the street fair. And um, so Karen and Alex have given us information. Well. I mean, people have said how important the street fair is. To me, this isn't about whether the street fair is important or not. It's does the village just automatically fund $18,000 to the chamber for the street fair? And if we are funding the chamber, is that how we want to do it? Um, and I don't know how it happened that I don't know if it was just sort of incremental. I mean, the street fair used to be one event, and it's grown, and then it was two events, and I don't know what kind of uh, negotiation there was between the, the village and, and the, um, the chamber. To me, and, and I did, I mean, I don't have all of the information, but I did look at the, um, income, how you spend the money, where it comes from. To me, I'm wondering, like, can't you, and, and I, I would think there could probably be some middle ground, but can't you, like, raise the fees for well, street fair? Well, I so think, is, I, you know, you asked if we had Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to focus it a little bit. So um, do you have some other things as well? or? Matt, that is the main thing. I guess I feel I don't just, I'm not comfortable just automatically donating $18,000 to the chamber without some, like, we're doing this because of this, and this is how it happened. And okay. Well, I think, yeah, Karen, please. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess when I look at a piece of paper that says that um, the tourism economy, the destination economy of Yellow Springs brings $16 million into the economy of Yellow Springs. And, and the, uh, the basis of these, of these numbers, I, can, I think, is pretty well explained. I, I can't wrap my head around why we're talking about $18,000. Know, I know that there have been um, incentives. We talk about incentives. We talk about incentives for economic development. We talk about incentives for housing, for affordable housing, and the, and the, um, the financial impact of those projects doesn't come close to the, financial, to the annual financial impact of the destination economy of Yellow Springs. And that I call it that. I don't like to just call it. It's not just about tourists. It's about our own people. It's about events. It's about supporting organizations like Arts Council. It's about supporting the PTO. It's about supporting the Glen, Glen Helen, WISO, significant nonprofits, Little Art Theater. Um, it, it, it's, it's this package of amenities, of attractions that <coughs> make Yellow Springs what it is. And I, I cannot tell you in, in you know, I was, I was on MVRPC for 12 years. I have had significant interactions with people all over the region. And they all know street fair. They all know events in Yellow Springs. And they're all incredibly envious. And more and more communities are, 
doing events. Um, Troy invests over $50,000 in their annual strawberry festival. Um, uh, Fairborn is doing more and more events. They're starting to support um, uh, their Halloween and zombie walk um, festival that they have. They do a, they do a, a car show. I mean, it, it's communities are actually doing more of this than less of it because it is so important to the um, to the vibe and to what the community has to offer. The citizens appreciate it. Um, it creates a community that people want to live in and that people want to visit and that people want to open businesses in and that people want to um, want to invest in. Um, you know, I mean, if you want to get into the details of how we got to where we are, I mean, we, you know, the chamber is, is, is spending $72,000 a year on street fair, on things like um, the stage that we use for um, the music fest, on the, on the sound people, on the musicians, most, most of which are local, on the, um, uh, on the, on the shuttle system that we, that we do to make things easier, to, to keep traffic out of town on more dumpsters, on people to remove the trash, on, what else, Alex, porta johns I mean, every year we have more porta johns at Street Fair. So, so, the, so, the, so the chamber, it, every year we increase the amount of money we spend on Street Fair because we're working with Chief, we're working with Johnny to make it as easy as possible. I'm going tomorrow to pick up a bunch of signs to keep people from coming into Yellow Springs. You know, so, so it's really a great collaborative, um, you know, and I know, I mean, it really is about street fair. I mean, there, I don't know that there's another event other than Zombie Walk that comes even close. So we really, I guess, really need to be talking about street fair. I think what also bothers me are the, the banner, the charging for the banners. Um, I think that that's, um, that's gonna impact a lot of people. Um, because there doesn't seem to be discretion on that. That seems to be a charge. I don't know if it is just $200, but anyway. Um, I, I don't know, Marianne. I mean, if you want me to go into detail about, I don't, I don't know how, all that I, how we got to where we are. I just know that um, when I started, at, when I started with the chamber, things were kind of a mess. I mean, nobody was organizing street fair. Traffic was a mess. It wasn't coordinated. The chamber wasn't involved in those kinds of logistics. All that we cared about was getting those vendors in and making our money. When I got there, we started coordinating and we started being a partner in this um, to make the event go smoothly and to make it an event the community can be proud of. And that's how it grew to where it is. That's, that's how, as far as the amount of time the amount of work that and, and money that the village is, is investing, that's, it's just to make it a better event. That's how, it, how we got there. I'm trying to remember, because you were on the council when we started talking about events. Why did we start looking at it? <laughs> about events? Sorry. About the cost, about this whole question of Well, I think it just, it's, char just, it's a question that's come from um, some citizens. I was just trying to remember. I, you know, yeah. I, think, I think staff, I yeah. think it was something that Patty, I don't know if other staff members brought it up, but I think it's just something that has been um, uh, an underlying um, discussion. Okay, I was just trying to remember. I mean, I think, I mean, quite honestly, you have made this, uh, you've, this, this issue of the destination community, I think you've done that, all, not by yourself, but you played a very key role. And given, you know, that our college closed, and yes, it's reopened now, but you know, just given all the hits we've had uh, economically, um, it's kept us afloat kind of as a community. I mean, the Friday night events, I mean, the, act, the active downtown we have now, I remember when that wasn't Friday night, nothing was happening. Really, the Emporium started that, I think, with their Friday night, you know, music. wine tasting and music. Mm -hmm. But then there was an opportunity, and really, I mean, I. I really think you're responsible. You, you're, you um, can take responsibility for all those successes. So, and the chamber. Um, so, <coughs> I think it's a case. Well, 
made that uh, Karen has made to us. And, you know, we don't want to, and I think it's worth looking at it because other people might come to us and other groups and it's good to, and I, one of the things I've, I've totally appreciated about Karen's leadership at the chamber is her inclusiveness. You know, when I think about like Village Fam and, you know, these mm -hmm. local young people who are musicians that, you know, so I, I've really appreciated that as well. It's been very inclusive. Um, so I guess I think it's been worth looking at, and I don't know exactly what we do with it, but I, I think Karen's made a very good point that okay. they, that this, that the chamber and the street fair have given a lot more than they've taken from the village. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you want to add anything? I'm good. Thank okay, Lisa? I think the only thing I'd, I'd reinforce is, is the point about the impact on nonprofits. I know that the, um, the village government, per se, is not in the business of funding nonprofits. But I've learned in my time in Yellow Springs that, um, you know, we're, we need to try to all work together in collaboration. And I've been on boards with several nonprofits. Um, for example, the Yellow Springs Kids Playhouse that I think you didn't mention that if it weren't for the annual fundraiser that they can do by parking cars, they would not have survived. Or the scouts. Yeah, right. And I, so I think, again, I, I think everyone on this council knows that I am very focused on the financial bottom line. Very focused. And it's not an insignificant amount of money. But I feel that in totality, the give back to the community as well as the economic boost that it gives um, I, I, I do not think that we should charge fees for events at this point. Yeah, yeah I just want to, I, I mean, uh, some very good comments. Uh, I, I really liked, Judith, I agree that um, you guys have done an excellent job of making the case, and it's what we've asked other nonprofits to do, like Home Inc., show us the economic return, and that has, is very clear to me now. Um, you know, it's, it's always been something that I believed, but to see the actual numbers. Um, and I think that's an important analogy to draw here. We've got to think about all the ways that we have a healthy, thriving community. Um, and that's through supporting all of our NGOs that basically give us that capacity. And, you know, beyond that economic development piece, it, this is delivering on our value of being a welcoming community and promoting diversity. Um, so that's, you know, I'm where Lisa's at and, and what I heard Judas say. Um, at this point, the return is, is so, so significant to me, um, I, I would not agree with charging for fees, charging fees for events. Um, so, Marianne, anything else? Well, you so that then does that mean that we want to have a positive statement that says any, I mean, are we saying, Anytime anyone wants to have any event, the village will support it and not charge. Do we want to have any criteria? Um, I think that it kind of ties back to what you asked about before, which is you know looking for something similar to what we're doing with the incentive policy. Again, I agree with Lisa that they're two different things, but justifying the benefit to our citizens and to our community is, I think, what's important. So I, I think that is something to look at um, moving forward. So, yeah, that sounds good to me. And, yep. and I just want to say, Karen, <laughs> you know, I, I have sort of, I have been leading this because I have not been comfortable just assuming that we would support the street fair and not charge. But that ha is no way it reflects what I think you have done for the street fair or the village because I remember the previous um, Chamber of Commerce, what was going on before. And I mean, you know, you do incredible work. So I just want to be clear about that. And I, and I also just wanted to have this be, if we're going to have, do this money, I don't want it just to be assumed. I would rather say, you know, we value this and we want to support it and this is what we're doing. Yes, I totally agree with that. that I mean, and I like that we're being transparent about it. I mean, that's critical. Um, okay, so I think we've made a decision on that. Yeah. Thank you, Karen and Alex. So do, um, wait a second, <laughs> clarifying question. Do we want to look at the current incentive policy 
to see if it will do the work that we're looking for here? I, I don't. Or I does don't it have to be that formalized? I don't think we're there yet. I, I think we've got other priorities. Okay. I, I think we just want to, you know, put a, a bookmark in it that this is something we want to continue to think but about. If we were, it seemed like maybe the Arts and Culture Commission mm -hmm. might be a locus for that because most of the events fall under that. I, think. I mean, I can have them look at it. It seems to be a reasonable thing that they might look at. Yeah. I think that would be a good start, and then we could get some recommendations. Right, with the, with the goal of having this not be like another layer of bureaucracy, or right, you know, that it would make sense and be streamlined. And right, but I, you know, I think Mar Marianne's point is well taken. That you know, it's not just we willy nilly support any event, right? I mean, there's got to be a good reason to do that. So um, I was passed a note asking if we could move um, some or all of the rest of the agenda to our next meeting. Um, so I just going down what I have. So uh, Lisa, are you comfortable with that about the late fees on utilities to move that to June 4th? Yes. It, it, can I point out something while we're right there? I just noticed, Lisa, that this says delayed electric service. And it needs to be all utilities because we have a combined bill, and that's the number that I gave to council was for. Oh, was a combined bill? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then let, we should delay it to okay. get it right then. Okay. And then um, I had said the clarification on commission budgets that can wait. That's a, a really easy thing, but we're fine. We've we've approved the things we need to approve. The documents are there. Um, we had the energy board. Could I just say real quick, yes. uh, we had a discussion, you know, we're, uh, we're trying, uh, Patty and Johnny and the Energy Board have been talking about an educational program to help people um, reduce their utility bills, which we've been wanting from, from the Energy Board. Uh, where we're at now is we would like for Patty to, I think Patty's, you know, signed up to write an RFP. Um, that would, it's kind of, I mean, the question is, well, anyway, an RFP uh, asking for proposals uh, 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 around that. And I don't know if council wants to put a cap on the cost. I mean, we were, we were thinking that it would, you know, I know there's only so much, much, much money left in the uh, commission pot. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much. Uh, 1500 yeah. So we're talking about something bigger than $1,500. Right. Yeah. So, um, but, so we were going to think about, um, you know, asking that it would come out of the general fund. I don't know. We were kind of just going to leave it open and see what kind of proposals we got in terms of cost. I mean, uh, the idea was, you know, a proposal that could be bigger or smaller and, uh, would it, you know. Would so. it make sense? Could we see kind of a draft of an RFP and weigh in on that? Sure. And at our next I mean, it's okay meeting, with me. Yeah, I, yeah. I have some thoughts about how okay. we incentivize this. So I'd, I'd like to, and I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about um, who's doing this work. You know, I, I mean, so, but it, but if we could put some ideas together, that'd be great. I I will commit to writing the RFP. I will not commit to having it by the next meeting, and I say that because I am absolutely swamped and just about at my max capacity right now. Um, I will do my best to get it done for the next one because okay. I've kind of already started on it. And when does the energy board meet again? Uh, the third, the Tuesday. third Tuesday. Yeah, the third Tuesday. So you'll have another council meeting before. But they don't, so have we already passed that? No. They're for meeting? this month? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Because right. yes. I was going to say it'd be nice if they could help Patty with that right. a little bit. Well, well she's and, asked for input. Okay. Yeah, and, and we have to we, we have to firm up some deliverables as well because yes. there okay. there are not any real firm deliverables back to me. Yet. Okay. Um, and then uh, public record requests. Are you comfortable with talking about that at yes. the next meeting? Yeah. Okay. But we do need to I think probably try to set our date for the work session, which will not take five minutes. Is that? Do we want to try what to do work that? session? Um, on yeah. infrastructure, yeah. capital uh, projects. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. Um, and I will tell you that um, I think that it should be in July just to confirm that we have t enough time to get everything done. And Johnny has requested uh, some vacation the first part. So um, 
I would suggest anything from the second week of July on. So can we send you dates and we could figure it out that way? Yes. Okay. So second half of July. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering whether we want to do this in, well, I guess I'm sort of suggesting we might want to do it in the evening. Okay. In the evening and have it televised so that it's easy, mm -hmm. more accessible to the community. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not going to disagree with you on that. I'm, that's fine with me, but you need to be aware that we're talking about multi-hours here. I mean, we've, we've been sitting here for three hours and we're four hours with exec and we're all getting antsy and it's going to be about probably three to four hours by the time we hit every single one of them. So, we, yeah. you know, it just depends yes. on, it depends on how much information <laughs> you ask in addition. Right. right. Okay. So, well, we'll work on that. Um, okay. So then uh, we have various reports. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions uh, or things that they um, want to highlight. Um, for the people that wrote those reports, the chief is not here. Mm -hmm. Chris and Patty, do you want to highlight anything? Council, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? I, I do need to note um, publicly about the generator. That was my thing. Um, the backup generator at the Xenia Avenue list station did die on us, as, as council is aware. And um, to replace that, it's, a, it's an EPA requirement that we have that backup generator. Um, so it's, it was an emergency replacement that exceeded my uh, spending limit, but there is a provision in the charter, or I'm sorry, the administrative code that allows me to exceed my spending limit in emergencies that affect the safety, health, and welfare of these citizens. So and, and I, utilities. And utilities. And so I did authorize that purchase, um, and actually I think the generator is getting delivered later this week. Um, and then we can quit paying for the backup generator, the rental backup generator that we're paying for. And so, Patty also did reach out to me about it, so. And um. so I am required to tell you openly <laughs> at the next public meeting, and I have just done that. Okay. Uh, is there anything that anyone wants to highlight with their board and commission reports? I would. Yes, Very Lisa. quickly, regarding economic sustainability, given that the designated community improvement corporation is a topic of great interest for the council, and perhaps the community. Um, I just want to point out that the, um, D, uh, that the Economic Sustainability Commission is moving forward um, drafting a position paper and a purpose statement. In my report, it has a sort of an outline of what's included in that. And uh, we're beginning preliminary work on bylaws. So I just want to be certain that council knows that we are trudging forward with that and Great. if there's any concerns with that outline or what we're doing. Okay. I'm sorry, Lisa, a purpose paper and what? Um, it's in my report, Economic Sustainability. Uh, Lisa. A purpose paper and a preliminary work on bylaws. Uh, Lisa, do you have a, uh, any model bylaws? That we do have a, a model of bylaws. And one of the things we've talked about, I mean, I haven't gotten with you on this, is that we acknowledge that the position paper and purpose statement is the most important precursor document for this body to consider. And we know that once we get to the bylaws, uh, not to use this term in any uh, negative manner, but it's a lot of legalese. So that next step will be figuring out what our budget is for legal advice and getting your input and all that. Well, the creation <laughs> of the bylaws tend to be kind of pro forma right? based upon the makeup that you want. So you're, you're correct in your initial statement. So. I guess my point is is that let me know if you're looking for templates or other things and I can help streamline that process for you. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? I have two things. One, I wanted to just let council know that at Planning Commission, and I did note this, yeah, um, that the issue of flag lots came up. And flag lots are lots where there's essentially a, a driveway that goes back to a lot that's back behind another lot. I'm bringing that up because uh, I'm going to suggest that the Housing Advisory Board look into this more and that Council consider it because if we allowed, and we may or may not legally allow them, that's unclear right now, if we did allow that, it could, it could dramatically impact the number of uh, housing increased density, mm -hmm. pluses and minuses about that. And the, and the other thing was just to put out to Council, I had, I've been talking to Hope Taft 
about doing a presentation on groundwater protection. And I'm not clear exactly how, what venue that might happen in, but it could be part of our education around our wellhead protection plan. She is, I know, I think there's an interview with the paper that's coming out, and she's presenting with Tums Council Land Trust, but I'm not exactly clear what would be the best venue, so if people have ideas about that. Okay, anything else? Um, okay, uh, we've got a good list of future agenda items. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that uh, has not come up at this meeting that uh, anyone wants to highlight? Um, exit audit interview. Oh. Mm -hmm. So that needs exit audit and interview. I sent an email. Yeah, do you want to just? Um, we received our audit, uh, draft final audit from the um, Julian and Groovy, um, who is uh, contracted to do our audit. Um, there are a couple of things that they wanted to go over. We have the opportunity to either go over that in a, in a letter or in an exit interview. Brian and I talked and um, thought it would be good to have them come do an exit interview, interview for two reasons. First of all, it kind of is a clean between Melissa's audits and Colleen coming on board. Um, and also it's kind of a learning thing for new council members who have never been through that before. Um, and so they've looked at their schedule and uh, Bryce Frenzel from Julian and Groovy can come to the June 4th meeting. When we talked to him on the phone, he took like 10 minutes to explain the two findings <coughs> and what that means and it's pretty simple. So I don't foresee it taking more than 20 minutes total okay. um, on June 4th. Okay, anything else? Um, all right, and uh, we are not going to go back into executive session, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you.